All right, here we are. We're live. Will, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing good. We've had, as usual, we have a great discussion before we start recording. Everyone I've had on this show, we usually talk for a half hour, an hour before we start recording. <laughs> and then we have to stop and go, man, let's stop talking because these are all gems here. And we're yeah. gonna we're not going to have anything to talk about by the time we start recording. <laughs> but I wanted to bring you on because... You and I were both at the 2002 RKC. This was the second yeah. kettlebell certification ever in America. Right. It was Pavel Sotsaline's second course. And little did we know that it would go on to be such a juggernaut that it became. So what I wanted to get into is how did you end up at that course in the first place? What drew, what drew you out there? That's a, that's a really good question. You know, it's interesting because I literally had received, I was interested in Russian kettlebells. You know, I'm always interested in training methodologies, just personally, it's just a personal interest. I had zero interest in training people, even though I'd been a personal trainer through, supported myself through college and all that. But I was really at a, at a crossroads in my life. You know, I had a state this woman and no longer dating her. And then she claimed, you know, that she was pregnant. So I was like, am I a pending father? Am I not? A, you know, like, oh. you know, that was all questionable. So, and I didn't have a job at that point. I'd actually semi-retired. I was teaching martial arts and just kind of retired, living off of my savings because I'd worked since I was in like middle school. I was working the front desk of gyms. That's how I knew the gym culture is. I was too young to actually work the floor, but I could, you know, re work the register and schedule appointments for people and basically do towels. So I started out very humble, you know, in the, in the industry that way. So, so I've been in the industry for a long time and, uh -huh. you know, my friends can attest, they would visit me in middle school and high school, you know, at this gym working, you know, when they're out playing, I'm, I'm collecting a paycheck. Right. So, right. you know, in short, I was very torn because, you know, I didn't have a job, you know, I was even, I had a college degree, you know, you know, and I was literally looking for a job. Barnes and Noble wouldn't even accept me for a job. So I was like, man, what am I going to do? for a living if if I have a child coming in. You know, is this the nineteen nineties or this is right or this is two thousand two. This is two thousand two. This okay. is two thousand two. So and, and what was your degree in? My degree was in English. Okay. That so, explains why you didn't have a job then. Yeah, probably. <laughs> English, English writing. I, I was in religious studies, so you can you know how marketable that is. <laughs> You're forgetting how they were. <laughs> I couldn't was, I couldn't get a job at the at the management program for Enterprise Reddit Car with that degree. <laughs> and it was funny because I originally was up at Springfield College. Yeah. For, uh, you know, oh, okay. related yeah. stuff. But I was in the industry and I had already worked myself up to like being an assistant fitness director at a, at a club actually right behind uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's father's liquor store. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So I, we know his family too. That's another whole story. But that being said, the long story getting back to the original point was I was really at a crossroads like, man, you know, the kettlebell cert wasn't cheap back then, you know? No. Yeah. And I was like, man, you know, I wasn't sure whether I was going to have a child or be a father. You know, I was aware, but I wasn't sure if it was my child, you know, all these kind of uh, situations, you know, that I was in flux and I didn't have any support for my family. My friends were, they were so young. They were like, they were, weren't thinking that at all. You know, yeah. I was the first one to ever, have a house, have a kid of, of my peers. You know, I've always, always the pioneer, first one to have a job, first one to have a house, first one to do all these kind of things. So I was always ahead of the curve in terms of my age, my peer group. And so I said, you know what? I just, my big thing is to always employ who I enjoy, meaning I believe in strength. I believe in, I didn't know what kettlebells were, but I said, you know what? F it. I'm going to fucking do this. And I committed to the seminar and no one, you included, you know, Nate Morsig, you know, uh, yeah. Brett Jones, another Rob Lawrence, you know, nobody yeah, Tom, knew. Tom Berman was there. I mean, that was the, the, a lot of people in that class went on to do some cool stuff. Yeah. John Davies. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, John right? Davies. Yeah. Right. And uh, I was and no one knew what was, you know, I was in utter turmoil, but that was the catalyst for a tangent in my right. life. Right. And if you remember, uh, Abdul Kareem Al-Jabbar was there. Remember the NFL football player? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about him because I didn't remember his name. I don't really follow football, but I remember him, and he was a really cool guy there. Very cool. You know, it's funny because I don't follow football at all, so people were – initially, people were yeah. crowding around him, and yeah, I, yeah. I had no clue, so I was like, ah. And I had no interest because he was a football player because, that you know, right. again, I don't follow sports. But I remember specifically talking to him, 
and his, he brought his son Ibrahim. Right. And his son ran up and he's like, Daddy, Daddy. And he looked at him and he said, Excuse me, son. Do you see I'm talking to someone? He goes, Sorry, Daddy. And he stood there. That impressed me personally. Yeah, I like it. So much, right? That I was like, you know, I was like, hey, you want to grab dinner? You want to? So he and I hung out that whole weekend really? dessert. Okay, cool. So we became very good friends. He actually, I still have it in my desk somewhere. He wrote me a letter and he told me not to open it until later. Like he didn't want to, he, he was too embarrassed to have me read it in front of him. So I read it on the airplane taking off. And it was one of, you know, he's a devout Muslim. And he wrote this, talked about the, basically talked about how the wealthiest person is the human being who understands, you know, what true value is. And because he and I spent a great deal of time together, and his story is fascinating because he actually uh, grew up in Compton. Yeah. And when he got, when he was in college, he didn't know how to read. He was illiterate. Wow. So he whispered to me, you know, in the restaurant with his son, Nidhi Sinyan, and he was like, I didn't you know in college you know and, yeah. and i said and me being the asshole that i am i'm like what you didn't know how to read <laughs> until you were at, like at college you were illiterate i was like that's even hard and, and that's what i truly believe i go that's even harder to learn how to read and write once you're a full grown adult oh, you know yeah. and it's embarrassing i said that that garnishes more my respect and that's what i said to him and i yeah. said out loud so his son could hear and you know it's great because Later, one of my buddies who, who who was the strength and conditioning coach for the Bills and for the Colts, he was like, oh, I had him there. And, you know, he was trying to revive his career, but he had a lot of injuries. But right. we remained such good friends. But that, to me, has been basically the flagship story for why I've been successful. It's because I've cared about pe not who the people were, but yeah. who they really were. Yeah. You know, and that's why we're we're friends. That's why we're oh, yeah. sitting here talking that. So. I went there, and then all of a sudden, next thing I know, I started coaching people. So a lot of the people who went to that cert ended up becoming, you know, at least on the East Coast, New Jersey area. I, I produced a lot of RKC certified people and started pushing people, you know, towards that. And then I started training people and then, you know, to make a living. And then next thing you know, here I am now to this day. So that was the necessity, desperation, necessity, and then staying true to yourself in the time of stress instead of compromising yeah. yourself. That's really interesting because I was at a similar crossroads myself when I took that course. I was working as a business development manager for a company called Respond.com. Just a boring ass internet company. I don't even want to describe what I did because it was so boring. Just talking about it, just even just even saying what I just said already bores me. So I won't even get into what I did. But suffice to say that I, I wasn't happy in my personal life and I wasn't happy in my professional life. And I knew I needed to make some change. And I go, the first change I need to make is my professional life. Yeah. I'm not ready to give up this job yet because it's the first good paying job I've ever had. And I want to keep saving money and build the business on the side. You know, this was my mentality. So I was writing articles for T Nation. I was taking yeah. a couple online consulting clients, nothing major, but I, but I had some things going. And then after I took that course, I realized what I thought before I took the course that this kettlebell stuff is going to blow up. This is just an awesome training tool. It's a great home-based training system. It's dynamic. It's different. It's going to attract women because they're going to like the swinging motions. A lot of women at that time were not into weight training at all. Not like it is now with the whole proliferation of CrossFit. Then it was, I don't want to get big and bicep curls and bench presses are boring. Yeah. But the kettlebell thing was dynamic. So I knew it would, it would attract a different market. Yeah. It was also a way for me to get into the fitness industry with a unique selling point. Because while I was a fitness enthusiast, I didn't have any strong credentials. I didn't have a powerlifting background or compete in Olympic lifting. I was pretty strong for a guy in the gym, but nothing impressive for being a fitness professional. And there's a million people that have way better abilities than I had. So I knew that wasn't enough. And then I didn't have any official credentials either. I didn't have a kinesiology degree or even just a basic certification, a basic personal training certification, nor that I, nor was I even attracted to getting any of that stuff. But kettlebells, when I started using them, I go, I love this training tool. So let me go get some professional instruction so I know what I'm doing. And then I'm going to build my business around this because no one's doing that right now. No one's out there trying to build a business around kettlebell training. So it was a ground floor opportunity. And after I took that course, it reinforced that mentality more 
but not so much because of the training. The training was great. But what really had an impact on me was meeting people like you and Rob Lawrence and Brett and Tom Furman and Nate Morrison. Nate Morrison and I are really good friends. Oh, and that was our first meeting there. That's awesome. And I mean, it was a really interesting course. Some of the people in that course ended up taking my workshops later. They came back out and, and they were like, wow, you know, you, you've really progressed. Right. But what I mean by all this is that I'm finally talking to people that have a similar interest. And I, because yeah. I didn't have anyone like that in my life. I was the only guy who worked out. No one around me, none of my friends were really into working out. Nobody I worked with was into working out. I was always the, oh yeah, there's the buff guy or there's the workout guy. So it was really empowering for me to be around people with similar interests. Right. And then... You know, Pavel, Pavel and I had a falling out years later, unfortunately. Yeah. But then he saw a lot of potential in me. Absolutely. He, he did a lot to help further my career. And I always give him credit for that. That's not, that's not something that I've ever tried to, to marginalize or diminish at all. You know, he played a big role. If it wasn't for those first four years I spent in Dragon Door, I wouldn't have gone on to be able to do all the things I do now. I just wasn't happy there, which is why I left that organization. So I won't digress on that. But let me stay on point here. Pavel, Pavel, as you might remember, anytime he needed someone to, to be the whipping boy or to demonstrate something, he always grabbed me. And anytime yeah. I asked a question, he's like, hey, Mike, come on up, show everyone. Yeah. Right? So it's to the point where people at the class are like, okay, who is this guy? Because he kept yeah. bringing me up to the front of the room and so forth. And then he gave that little lecture during lunch one time, and someone was asking about heavy kettlebell snatches. And he's like, hey, Mike, come up to the front of the room and talk about what you do. You know, so he was, he was, he was a, he's a guy that was very different than other personalities at that time because other personalities they never wanted to put the spotlight on their students they always wanted to right. keep it on them and they wanted the students to direct all the spotlight to them as well so you never even really knew who their students were because it was always about them right. i mean everyone who was a big name at that time pretty much fell into that category yeah pa pavel was different pavel was if someone did something impressive and it wasn't just me at that class if someone else said let's say i think Brett had really good bent press technique. And he's like, hey, Brett, come up to the front of the room. Or Rob Lawrence had really good clean technique. He's like, Rob, come on up, show everyone what you're doing. That was, that was just what he did. And I think that's why, at least originally, the organization built really fast because he let the focus be on the training. And if someone had a good idea, he worked that into the system rather than steal it or say, well, that's not my idea, so I don't want to do that. So, so that course was, I, I, I mean, I, I went back home after that course and I was on cloud nine. I was so excited. I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And what's funny is there was a guy there who was an airline pilot. I forget his name, but he was a bald guy and he, he flew. He was literally a United Airlines airline pilot. That's what he did for a living. Okay. And he, he gave me a credit a lot of many years later because we kept in touch. He said that, you know what, Mike, everyone was talking about what they were going to do at that course but you're the only one I know of that actually went on and did anything. You know, obviously you did stuff too, but he didn't know you at that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's like, everyone else was talking about, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do yeah, that. Yeah. Like within weeks of that course, you've written 10 articles, you started teaching right. workshops and all that. And the best thing that happened to me after that course, because I still wasn't ready to quit my day job. I just had that fear-based mentality. And I bring this up because a lot of nine to fivers are in the same category. I really don't want nine to fivers to think that I've always been who I am now. Like this intensity of like, you know, burn your fucking bridges, go do that shit. Because I've been, I've been on their side of the court too. I get it. I understand that mentality. Yeah. But the best thing that happened to me is I got laid off. I got fired. And I remember when my boss, he's, he goes, Hey, you know, I want to take you out for a drink after work. And I already knew what that meant. I remember I went to get a, a, a session with my active release technique practitioner and she's working on my shoulder and I was like, yeah, you know, I think I'm about to get fired today. She's like, really? I was like, yeah, my boss wants to have a drink with me and he never does that. So anyway, suffice to say, he took me out for a drink. He said, your time with us is over. And I didn't like this guy at all. He had zero integrity. So I wasn't even disappointed about losing, but he did give me some really good advice. His parting words were, this working for other people, Mike, is not for you. You're an entrepreneur. So whatever you get into next, should, should be something entrepreneur like, so entrepreneurial type endeavor. Yeah. And in my head, I'm, I'm like, you know what? That's, you know, I mean, you're a fucking dipshit and you have zero yeah. integrity, but that's good advice. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes you get good advice from people that are not good people and don't even have good intentions. It's not like this guy cares about me, but he actually gave me good advice. And sometimes you get horrible advice from people that actually do care about you, but yeah. don't understand where you're coming from or just yeah. don't believe anything is possible. So advice is a tricky thing. Sometimes you, you don't have to like the person to take the advice is where right. I'm going to do it. And if you like the person, that doesn't mean you should take the advice just because of that. Correct. 
So what happened with you after you, you, you touched on it briefly, what happened after the course, but tell me about what happened when you got home and, and how things went from there. You know, I was very fortunate. I had a, a someone was, you know, I guess people would call a mentor. He's definitely an elder. He was a student of my uncle's martial arts student. And he's a, he was a bit of a rebel, a renegade. He oh. would, he's been across country on his Harley multiple times. You know, he, before there was UFC, he was, you know, fighting with uh, Dan Morgliato, who's a UFC. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's, because yeah. he was a, one of Bart Bale's shoot fighters. So, okay, yeah, I know who Bart Bale is. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Jay, you know, used to teach gym, gymnastics, so he'd gather all these, like, different uh, Yanazukas, judo guys. You know, he'd get all these different martial arts people together and just have them spar. And he was always, always willing to go. Like, he, he literally went across, he went to Europe on a Harley, sold the bike, yeah. flew back home. He was in India on a motorcycle. Like who, really? who goes through India on a, on a <laughs> motorcycle, right? <laughs> that's like, a way to see the country, that's for sure. Yeah, he's he a fucking nutbag, right? And he was going, doing Muay Thai in Thailand before there were commercial camps, before there were foreigners. There he was, he was out there doing, you know, boxing, you know, you name it, he was game for, it, you know. So he was a tough guy. He would always come back to my uncle's school whenever he was in town and just beat the shit out of all the black belts. So that's how my uncle knew he was in town. There would be like a line of injured people outside and be like, what the fuck's going on? It's like, oh, Jay's back in town, right? And he, he was just a badass. And so he decided to open up a school. So, you know, we started training together and he would invite people down all the time and they would never come back because they would get humiliated. They would get their ass whooped and they'd never come back. So they'd rather be, you know, the big fish in their small pond. Me, I always strive to be the small fish in the big pond. So my whole thing was I trained with him regularly. He used to beat the shit out of me. And then what happened was my conditioning would go up because of kettlebells. So we would run this Marine because he ended up becoming a Marine too. That's a, that's another story. So we would run this obstacle course and all my numbers would go up. And then we were going up training martial arts with this one guy in upstate New York. And I had a little Nissan Sentra and the, and the bolts were rusted on. And he had, he's super aggressive. He's super alpha. So he's like, and he never called me by my first name. He's like, John, you know, Oh, you know, and he's rocking and it's Sentra, like a 94 Sentra is like a little shit car, right? right. And it's it's rusted on because it had no hubcaps and he's shaking the whole car trying to get these lug nuts off. He's shaking the whole car. And I'm like, and you know me, I'm 10 years his junior and I'm also junior belt rank wise and he could beat the shit out of me constantly. So whenever he'd be like, I think we should do kettle. I said, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm beating the shit out of you all the time. Like you got nothing to contribute to the conversation was his basic <laughs> attitude, right? Yeah. So he was trying to loosen up and change his tire. And I was like, I, and he was like, let me try, you know? And it's like, you know, I could have used your testosterone booster back then. I didn't even <laughs> have any hair on my balls or anything. So I was just like, I was young. I was like 19, you know, I was very young. And I, and I would do it I, and I loosened it. And he's like, ah, oh. he figured he had loosened it already right, for me, right. right? And then he tried another one. And again, it was bolted on and it was rusted. And I went on and I just, and he's like, what the fuck, right? I was like, kettlebells. And he was just like, what the fuck? And I've been doing everything the public I did the breathing, I did everything, the pull right. the dowsing, everything. Face for it, all that. Yeah, yeah, everything, right? Even like the, you know, the breathing through the tube yeah, and the power blood, thing, yeah. Everything he told me to do. And so <laughs> he he literally then saw all my numbers go pull up, strength. He started he started when he was grabbing me, he was like, What the fuck? You're getting stronger. So I started showing him the stuff. And again, being the alpha male that he is, he goes, told me one day i signed up for the course i was like well you could have told me either way whatever he went came back and he was fucking pissed and i was like why and he got he got certified you know he's blah 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 he goes he goes because i had progressed and taught him much more than the cert taught him so like just like you and i had progressed so he's like yeah i fucking wasted my money i should have just spent that money on a set of kettlebells so he, he went to the very first kettlebell certification the one before you and i went to no no much later, after after we. Had oh, been. okay. After, okay. So, I'm getting the line wrong. Yeah. So, so that's why, just like you know, people who visited your seminars and like, man, you really took this to the next level. Uh, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. His perception of it, and he's the one who snaked it without telling me at first that he did it. You know, he just tr he, trying to one up me. You know. Which one was he? Yeah, because I might have been at that. Which which do you remember? Third I don't or fourth? Which one? I was pretty fourth. much at the. But, I was at the third one on for quite a few of those courses. Oh, you know what? I can show you a picture of him. Maybe if you recognize his face. He's he's a very, like, John Wayne, you know, type of person. 
He's a he walks like kind of almost duck footed. He's a guy in the red shirt in this picture. This is him. Yeah, I mean that vaguely looks familiar, but I can't say for certain. Do you remember the year? Was it 2003, 2004? If it was 2002, it had to be 2005 and under, somewhere around that. that okay. Time. So I was probably, I mean, I wasn't at every single one for, for 2002 to 2004. I think I was at most of them. And then, and then we started rotating between me and the other guys. 2006 right. was completely out. So I might have been at that. I believe you were because I asked him if you were there and he was, he was talking about it. I was like, yeah, because, again, he ended up joining the Marines later in life, like 30-something. Wow. And after 9-11, he got shipped over to Fallujah, Iraq. So he was part of five-man insurgent team. Wow. Like going in and he was in, in control. He was in, yeah. And he wow. was in such great shape. He was excused from daily PT for because he, wow. he was older than most of the guys. So he, I actually, you talk about Nate Morrison. I reached out to Nate because he wanted a kettlebell. So I was asking Nate, what was the best way to get a kettlebell over there? Yeah. To him. So I sent him, you know, Blu-rays and candy and, you know, whatever he wanted all the time. He said, he's like, send me, you know, enter the dragon on Blu-ray. I need to educate these fools. On some movies <laughs> and stuff like but my point being is how i progress and this is a good way to summarize what happened in the interim to now is he called me up and again he never took advice from me from then taking advice from me and that's been my whole career whether it be through college education whether it be through training that my mentors have then eventually i've earned a spot as their peer and then at some point it flipped where they asked for my education or coaching or on a particular topic or the same topic. So, right. so I ended up training him and he called me on a sat phone and he said, John, I just got off the phone with my parents. I said, who else do I want to talk to? And he says, because I just want to say one thing to you because everything you taught me, proof is in the pudding. It, everything worked, in, you know, knife to knife, you know, going in, in buildings because people don't understand. It wasn't like, you know, like colonial times or traditional times where the red coats were there we're over here. It's like it's, yeah. when you're entering an urban building, you don't know if a woman, a child, you don't know who is on your side or not on your side. Right. And you have these four other guys that you're hunting down, you know, Al Qaeda, you know, that. And, and he said it was a wild west. He goes, I feel like Wyatt Earp. There's no law out here. There's no regulation. And that was early on in his uh, career. And now he, you know, I still talk to him, obviously. You know, I spoke to him a month ago. He's retired, lives in Arizona. He told me he retired as the highest ranking staff sergeant in Marine Corps history for civil affairs for this particular, like, you know, I don't know the abbreviation. So like, like L95, you know, because right. he, he established the civil affairs program down in Quantico. So he was one of the lead founding members for that. And of course, when he was uh, out in California at Pendleton, he was teaching kettlebells. When he was, in Quant he was still teaching those same kettlebell things that he had learned from you and from me collectively and from Pavel uh, to Marines. So, you know, that's a great success story. And when people reach out to me how to be successful in the industry, I tell them to dominate your market. You have to, you know, you know, two things. You have to be, you have to be high caliber because being really good will forego a lot of things. Like I don't even have a website, you know, like it's all word of mouth for me, right? So be excellent at what you do and be excellent at conveying what you do. In other words, be very good at conveying. So those are, those are the two sides of the coin. Most people, they take like an Insta course and they think they need to hashtag stuff and do this. And I tell them that's, <laughs> that's the wrong approach because most of those guys that they look up to, I know personally, and they're broke. They pulled up in my driveway in a, in a busted up Honda with a, you know, old fashioned Tom Tom to get to my house, like device. And like, oh. They don't even have modern map, you know, GPS. It's like, like, it's funny because even, I don't like to name names, but it's like even so-and-so. I remember this guy goes, I wish I made this kind of money. I was like, that guy doesn't make that kind of money. Like, <laughs> you know, you know? Yeah. And I know the guy personally, you know? There's a, there's a lot of that bait and switch type mentality too, where people try to project this lifestyle. Even back then, there was a lot of that. But now there's even more. And I think especially in Western culture, there's so much emphasis on your value as a person is predicated on your income. Yeah. And I think that's a really dangerous lesson to keep passing on to each generation because I see even really young people, they're in high school and they're already money hungry. They're like, okay, what am I going to do that's going to make me a lot of money? 
And I go, you're asking yourself the wrong question. What's the right question? The right question is, what are you going to do that's going to make you really excited and happy? Right. And they're almost looking at me as if that's not even a possibility. Yeah. That they have to make a lot of money and then they can go spend that money to be happy. But while they make the money, they're going to be miserable. Yeah. And yeah. some people can maybe do that. But usually it ends up being a lot of self-destructive habits permeate from that as overcompensation. Now you feel... I'm in a relationship I don't want to be in. I don't like my job. So I'm going to use that to rationalize going to the strip club every afternoon for lunch. Or I'm going to start hiring high-level prostitutes because, hey, why not? I deserve it. I take care of my family. I make a great income. And I'm going to treat myself. And there isn't anything inherently wrong with those things. But in the context of using them as forms of overcompensation, it's very negative and leads to negative consequences. You know, if you love what you do for a living and you engage in those things, that's a different story. But if you hate what you do for a living and then you're overcompensating, you're, you're abusing substances, Correct. you're taking cocaine, you're overusing Correct. marijuana. And again, there, there isn't anything inherently wrong with drinking alcohol or using marijuana, but when it becomes something that's an overcompensation tool, then it's distracting you from what you really need to do. So the fitness business, whenever people talk about how much money they want to make in this industry, I go, if those, that, that's the wrong motivation. I didn't get into the fitness industry to make a lot of money. That wasn't right, even a concern right. of mine. Right. I wanted to do something that I love doing for once because I've never done that. Every right. job I ever did, I hated. I didn't enjoy any of it. There was no gratification. There was no satisfaction. I would be tired all the time, not because I was working so hard, just because I had no purpose. It wasn't exciting. You wake up, you go to work, you put in your time, you come back home. It was so, it was so mundane. There were no surprises. There was no excitement. But most of all, I never got any gratification. No one ever sent me an email saying, hey, Mike, thanks a lot for helping us work out that business development deal. It really means a lot to my family. And no one's going to say that. No one cared. But when I, I remember the very first workshop I taught, and what I did after the RKC is I made my own little internship. I trained volunteer firefighters for free. So I wanted to get some practice. So it was twofold. One, I'm helping people that are deserving of help. But two, I'm getting some practice where if I suck, it's okay because right. I'm doing it for free. <laughs> you know? So right. if these volunteer firefighters come out and like, man, this guy sucks. I'm like, all right, well, you're not paying at least. So right. it's, it's, or at least it's free. While if right. I'm charging and I suck and they say I'm suck, that's, that becomes a different story. Right. But bottom line is they loved it and I loved working with them. So finally, right. that was my first gratification trade-off where now I'm doing something I really want to do and the people that are coming love it. I'm like, okay, I think I've got a little knack for this. After six right. weeks of that, I go, let me try doing my own workshop. Let me charge for this. And right. it was 65 bucks. You know, it was nothing. It was 65 bucks for two hours. And I remember eight people came out to the Spring Hill Rec Center near where my parents live. And I, during the entire course, I just had moments in my mind where I'm like, man, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is awesome. These people are loving it. It was just like when we all met at the RKC, except now it's my own course. And now I have students coming out. They're happy to meet me. I'm happy to meet them. We all had lunch afterwards. And afterward, I made 480 bucks that day. And I remember it to this day because I w it was the most satisfying $480 I ever made up till that point. And that gave me a lot of confidence knowing that you're on the right path. Right. Now, was it smooth sailing after that? No. And I didn't, I didn't expect it to be. And I wouldn't expect it to be smooth sailing now. And I'm not worried about smooth sailing. I'm worried about doing what I want to do because I'll blast through all those impediments if, if I want to do it. Right. If, if something comes between me and something I really want to get done, I'm going to blast right through that fucking thing with right. full force. If it's not something I want to do, then I won't. So I, I only focus on what I want to do you know, because otherwise I'm not going to like every, everyone else. I'm going to give up. And that's why like, I want to I want to get your thoughts on this. Every year we have this New Year's resolution type thing. Right. And it's always I want to lose weight. I want to get healthier. OK. Do you actually care about those things or are you doing it because someone else is telling you you should or you read about it somewhere? But do you actually care about achieving those things? Right. Because if the answer is no, then don't bother. Right. Just keep eating a crappy diet. Keep watching TV Correct. because that's what you enjoy. You're like, oh, man, that's pretty negative, Mike. It's like, no, it's not negative. What's negative is trying to take someone to a place they don't want to go to. I don't want to work with anybody who needs me to motivate them. 
meaning they don't want to do it. So I have to make them do it. You can't make anyone do no. anything for a long enough period where it's going to have any kind of measurable result. We all need motivation in one way or another, but we need to start with self-motivation. I think you hit the nail on the head, Mike. You know, I, I, one thing I want your audience to really understand is back when I first met you, you know, and you were working at that, at that uh, you know, internet company, you were a beast because you were doing pistol squats. You know, at work you were doing you were doing handstand push-ups i remember i distinctly remember that so i want i want people to understand you know who are accustomed to watching the five minute rocky montage to get pumped up you know for their fucking workout is that this has been over time for all for for us right and that because you just like with the with the fire department you know i you and i have the same philosophy in terms of the over under we don't believe anything is inherently bad when people are like well what do you think about sugar or this or that's like it's, it's how you utilize it. I don't think it's, it's, it's the abuse of it and it's the compensation of it that is the issue, you know? Right. And, you know, I'm sure as you have, you know, I've trained a lot of people who are exorbitantly wealthy. And, but the point being is I have no debt and I'm not restricted from doing what I want and I'm not beholden to anybody. Whereas right. people I know who make a larger paycheck, forget about even people in the industry, some of my friends, you know, some of my peers, they, they're afraid to lose their medical benefits or because lose their job or, you know, it's all related to self-worth. And I see it in the fitness industry too. My whole thing is do what you love and what, what you love will, you know, create organically and support the lifestyle that you purport. And that's, that's what I live. You know, you and I live a very casual lifestyle in terms of work. We make our own schedule. We're not beholden to anybody. You know, we get up when we want to get up. We get as much sleep as we want to sleep you know you and i live very similar life cycle. you know when i call you, you're sitting there eating you know feeding grover doing this we're we're, right. we're very similar i could be laying at the beach i could be doing this and i've made that point to many professionals who reach out to me whenever I, they've reached out to me when have i not had time to converse with them you know and when have i not had time whereas most people are running so ragged yet they have what i call you know too much toast not enough jelly you know they're spread right. so thin right? right and they're right. trying to appease and they're trying to do all this stuff and you know, I was very similar, you know, when I started out too with kettlebells, there was a guy, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu was just starting out. And this guy, he and his buddy Dan, you know, this guy Josh Madama was very skilled. He's one of Henzo Gracie's early guys because in when Henzo was fighting, he was in his corner, like literally in his corner. Very so cool. he's one of the early adopters. Yeah. So John Danaher is really popular now, but he was taking privates from John Danaher. Like back in the day, he told me, he goes, this white guy is the guy to go to, not one of the, I go, really? He's like, yeah, there's this guy, John Denner. He's sick. You should see, he's like, you know, so Josh and I were friends and the way we got to know each other was this guy. I joined when I moved down here, a local world's gym, you know, just cause it was close and nearby. And you know, you have to have an emergency contact. And I was teaching still at one of my uncle's affiliate schools. So the owner of that school I made as an emergency contact. So this guy said, oh, you teach more shorts. So he introduced me to Josh because he would take people in the aerobics room and choke people out. Like that was their like, you know, which is old like Gracie Jiu Jitsu challenge, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, we're going to take you out. But Josh took me back there and he was very respectful. Like, he goes, let me see you hit the bag. So I hit the bag. He's like, all right, let's, let's do no striking. Let's grapple. And he was a great guy. And he, he tied me up 20 sides a Wednesday. I tapped multiple times, but he loved my attitude. He loved that I, you know, loved learning and I had no ego and I worked hard. So he, he would come over to my house when we'd, you know, roll around in my garage when we'd been friends. He was a cop, and then he opened up a school part-time, and then that turned into his full-time position, and we, he retired. And I started teaching at his school, and when he started out, he didn't have much money. He's like, I don't, I, I can only pay you like 20. I was like, bro, save your money. I don't want, I, give it to you, the other employees. I don't, I don't want any money. And from that day forth, and he would always be like, hey, do you want, I'm making more money. I was like, no, I want nothing. So people don't realize, because one of his top guys who now bought the school from him works with one of my clients. He goes, you know, I spoke to, you know, Josh is like, I found out Will doesn't take any money. Did you know that for all those years of training? And she goes, I didn't know that personally, but that sounds like him. That's what my client said. And I was the most consistent person who taught. I never canceled. I always showed up. I always gave notice if something was up, like I had to go train a fighter or had a fight. And I ended up training all these amateur guys to now to the point where I train world champions, literally. And now I'm still consulting in on UFC, top UFC. Like people are sending me private 
you know, videos going, what do you think? I'm like, you have to make this guy do this. You have to have him rotate this. Yeah. And nobody knows about it. Like that. I'm still proactive in that regard. And my big thing is I love the spirit of mixed martial arts. Like, you know, Anderson Silva's Muay Thai coach was telling me about Mark Henry, who's Frank Henry's, uh, Frankie Edgar's coach. And he's like, yeah, I'd really like to meet up with them. And I'm happy to facilitate that. So I reach out to Mark Henry. I go, hey, he goes, hey, next time he's out here, let's get together. I said, great. And that, I love that kind of spirit because Mark's always been very generous. I've been to his house. He's very welcoming. I, you know, I know Fra I trained Frankie Edgar's father. I trained Frankie Edgar, you know, like, like I know his, uh -huh. I know his, the godfather to his godson. I know his cousins, you know, like what, when I train someone, I get ensconced because even before I started training Frankie, his wife called me, his father called me, you know, his trainer met with me. Like all these people kind of screened me and, you know, I, I, kind of like that to me is whether it's, you know, being a football player at the RKC cert, you know, you know, or whether it's you, our relationship, that's been my success is hard work and communication through connection, conveyance of that, that connection through sweat equity and through just sincerity. And that's, that's what's built my career to this point that I could show you video footage of multiple people and they'd be like, Oh, and it's all private. You know, I, I make, and it used to frustrate me that people wouldn't hashtag me or give me credit or, you know, it's funny because John Wolf, before he went to on it, he was thinking about going to Dragon Ball and he was going to write a book, publish a book with them and do all this. And he goes, Hey, come with me to Dragon Ball. I was like, bro, I was like, I was already there. I left there for a reason. Like I faded to black on that for a reason. And he's like, Oh, and then he went to the headquarters to, and he goes, I saw a picture of you. He sent me a picture. He goes, picture of you in the class i was like yeah i was part of the second class I'm like i don't talk about stuff like that but yeah and what's great is you know he had just had a daughter and this is what i do for people in the fitness industry that most people don't know i'm like bro you just had a daughter you need a contract you need benefits you need a salary you need something written to ensure your family's future and what people don't know is how many people you know they may know of john wolf of Honor, but how many people can say they know they met his sister, they met his mother. And when I first met him and he had me out for a seminar, he he we swung by his mom's house and his, his sister was like in high school. So it's big family, you know, big Mexican family, kids from all different ages. And, you know, she was an ocean kayaker. And she was stressed. She was telling her, John, you know, money was tight and she lost like her or she needed something for high school. So I. I asked him, you know, and I, this is me just meeting John. Like, I, I met him once in Las Vegas through Scott Sonic. And I was like, what's the deal? He goes, oh, yeah. And he was stressed about money, basically. And I said, bro, take money out from the seminar and give it to your sister, whatever she needs. And, and that was way back then, you know. And I built myself because I've slept on his sofa. I know his first wife, you know. Like, I, I know his whole staff. You know, one of my best friends now is one of his former, you know, uh, clients. You know, and I still talk to her all the time and spend time with her family. So I'm very grateful. And I still hear from John every once in a while. But what people don't understand is, and he just had taken, hosted me for a seminar. And then he went to on it for the interview. He's like, bro, I got the job and I used material that I learned from your seminar mm -hmm. to work with MMA fighters to get sure. the job. And so my ego from that place forward, a lot of people use my material without crediting it, uh, doing it. And then I remember, you know, Hunter Cook had asked me, he, this one kid, he said, I went to the seminar, this guy used your material, even used your coaching cues. I go, as long as he doesn't use my jokes, I'm okay with it. And he's like, <laughs> why is that? And I said, because the last time I saw so-and-so, I was, I was presenting iPhone 5. You know, this was years ago. And I said, I'm presenting iPhone 6, and I'm working on iPhone 7 and 8. So it, it doesn't phase me because I'm constantly evolving. And he was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And, but yeah. it took a lot of hustle because I went through periods of ego, jealousy. Yeah. Why are, you know, I would have a, a, a group that has a cert. You know, they have their own certification. They're well-known. One guy would Skype with me and talk about how all this material I'm breathing he has. Yeah. You know, like we do box, Mark Devine's box breathing. We do Wim Hof's this. And all it is is a hodgepodge of various things without any connection. So, so I told the, the, the gentleman, I said, hey, do me a favor. Get on all fours, put a specific line it up. Do this. Get your body under your structure. Now do this. And I coached him through. Breathe out. Through the, 30 seconds, he's bowling over. He's like, my abs are cramping as fuck. I was like, yeah. And then I said, 
you can do three hours of hodgepodge or you can do 30 seconds of something very effective and very leaving the imprint on your people. And then that weekend, I saw on social media that he was teaching that drill. My thing for people, and that's why people, I rub people the wrong way, is work it. Work it for three months before you show, minimum. Minimum of three months. I would prefer a year, but work it. And that, my standard, because I was raised in a martial arts family, you know, and that's why a lot of people romanticize Mr. Miyagi or Pai Mei, and I get a lot of those <laughs> analogies. Look, I know tough guys. I'm not a tough guy. I know a lot of tough guys. I was raised around a lot of tough guys. I just hung. You know, I was a small fish. But the people who claim to be tough, they're not tough. Because I know I'm not tough. And it's nothing compared to what I was raised with, right? And to me, what I think is really important is for people to really in really dive in and commit towards being passionate because they're two, what I call ABC syndrome. Even one of the guys, I don't remember his name at the RKC. He, sh he showed me his business card and it had all these, you know, ABC, BBD, you know, you know, all these certs, you know, ACE, you know, NASM, you know, and to me, it's just a circle jerk. Like, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean shit, right? Yeah, I agree. And I agree. that's what I love about training and martial arts because it's like you can talk all the belts you want all the right knock me on my ass you know 500 pounds is always 500 pounds get it off the fucking floor you know right so i love that purity yeah if you have the information no one cares about your credentials i put out a lot of hormone optimization information i'm not a doctor right i didn't study hormone optimization i didn't study endocrinology i don't have a biochemistry degree i don't have any of that stuff i'm self-taught but I'm, I'm respected for that knowledge, though. Correct. People come to me all the time. Every day I get emails about hormone optimization stuff. It's never about kettlebells. It's rarely about training at this stage in the game. And no one's asking. They're asking me for help. They're not asking me for my background first. Right. So when you have the knowledge and you put it out there, especially yeah. if you put it out there so generous, generously as you do, you start attracting people. People start coming to you. And I think this is... I think a lot of people are really incredulous when they hear what you're saying. Here's what I mean. Because they, they, they don't understand how it works. Yeah. Because from their mindset, it's got to be about, I want to make this much money and that's got to be a priority. Right. Everything else comes secondary. Right. They're not thinking that if you just focus on excellence, that the results you want and maybe even beyond are going to come. And even if they fall short... If you make an income that falls short of what you think you want to make, but you love what you're doing, yeah. you're not really going to care. Yeah. It's always, I want to make six figures. And my response is always, what, $95,000 is not enough? $85,000 yeah. is not enough? Why has it got to be six figures? Why is that so important to you? It's this arbitrary yeah. thing that we always hear. You know why it's important? Because it sounds good at a, at a cocktail party. Oh, I make six figures doing this. It's like, well, first of all, it's tacky to talk about whatever it is you make. And no one who makes a lot of money ever does. People right. who make $10 million a year, they don't talk about it. They don't find some try to clever way to interject it into the conversation. Correct. It's tacky. So whatever you make, no, one's, no one should know what you make anyway because you keep it to yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. So it really doesn't matter. But it's more like an ego status type thing. They want to be, oh, I'm part of the six-figure club. Right. So what? Are you a good person? Are your clients satisfied? Are you respected in your industry by your peers? What about all those things? Right. So your, your philosophy on how things, oh, actually, one thing, I'm a big fan of the Bhagavad Gita, right? I read that a lot growing yep. up. My yep. mother, while other kids were reading Captain America comic books, my mother was giving me these Hindu comic books. Right. So I'm learning about all these characters in the Mahabharata and all these <laughs> Indian gods like Hanuman and Krishna and so forth. That's what I was reading in comic right. books. I didn't read Superman and Batman and all that right. stuff. My mother's feeding me all that. And I remember the first time I read the Bhagavad Gita, there's a saying in there that says, you have a right to your actions, but not the results of your actions. And coming from a guy who grew up in the Western world, I was like, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah. yeah. So I work my ass off, but I don't get to enjoy the results. You know, that, that's the way I interpreted it yeah. with my mindset at the time. And as I got older and I kept reading that statement, it would start changing. It would start sinking in. Yeah. Maybe a couple of years ago, I, far, I started really grasping the meaning of that. Yeah. The importance of lack of attachment when it comes to outcomes. Yeah. Because you don't have control over outcomes. You never do. People like to think they have control over things. We don't have any control. This pandemic should teach us that if nothing else has. Yeah. You don't have control. One day you're living this life, the next day you're shut at home. You didn't have any control over that. 
But what you can't control is your response to that. What are you going to do now? What are you prepared to do? So if you focus on, I'm going to put in the best effort I can during that action phase. That's all I'm going to focus on. Yeah. I'm not thinking about the result. The result's going to take care of itself. Right. But it takes a lot of maturity or life experience to get to that point. So I'm curious, how did you get to this point at so early in your career? Because I got to be honest, I, I wasn't money motivated when I first started. No, but I, same but, I, but I was definitely concerned about making a certain income, no doubt about it. Maybe that's because I was living in Los Angeles where everyone's so shallow and all that. <laughs> I didn't want to make a lot of money to drive a fancy car. I drove a fucking Honda Civic until I was with that 100,000 miles on it until I was probably 38 or something like that. I didn't get my first nice car is my Hummer H3, which I didn't buy until 2010. And I've had it ever since. That's the first nice car I've ever had. Didn't buy a house until recently, a couple of years ago. So these aren't things I cared about necessarily, but I definitely wanted to make a good income, not so much so I could tell people about it, just so that I can live the life I want to live because you need money to pay bills, need money to take care of your family. You need money to donate to charities if you want to do it. So we need to make money. Correct. And you do make money, right. but it's as a result of this really interesting mindset you have. So this, is this something that you were brought up with? When did they come along? You know, definitely East meets West, right? Cause my yeah. father, you know, has a PhD from teachers college, Columbia university. So I grew up with both captain America and comic books, <laughs> and the Bhagavad Gita, and Zen really? in the art of archery, Zen in the you know, art of motorcycle maintenance. You know, like my father was always wow. seeking some type of education and spirituality. You know, and he was at the forefront because he was getting journals back then on nutrition, on cardiorespiratory health, anti. Like I learned about anti- antioxidants from my dad before I ever heard it in the mainstream. Like people talk about antioxidants and resveratrol, and you know, quercetin and all these. You know, and I, nutrition isn't my forte, but what I'm saying is all these advanced concepts about aerobic capacity, Kenneth Cooper, uh, weight training. You know, my dad would say, he goes, right. this is going to be the future, you know, watch, you know, and uh-huh. he was really smart. He was very perceptive. What he ended up doing and ended up retiring was working for, he moved back to Korea to take care of his parents before they passed, my grandparents. And he took a job with the government basically. And I, it was a weird job. I didn't understand it at the time, but. They called it a rec specialist. So basically anything that was non-military related, he handled everything from weight, the weight lifting gyms, the golf courses, Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders to Randy Travis, to any entertainment, to anything. He was in charge of all, including all the way up to the DMZ. So I used to go and I spent my summer up based out of Camp Pelham to the joint security area where there are no civilians allowed. That's it's all military personnel. So I hung out with all the spec ops guys. I lifted with them. I was a kid. I, I, I was sitting there with a barbell with like 10 pounds on each side. They're all like, <laughs> Come on, bro. You know, like, these, like jacked, yeah. you know, like spec ops guys. And I remember playing pool with them and I don't know guns. That's not my forte, but there was a live weapon leaning against the table. And I went to just move the weapon and everyone jumped on me. I, I wasn't trying to pick it up or play with it. I just wanted to a clear shot for pool, right. you know? And these guys were like, you know, I was very fortunate to have all these types of mentors. And the most important thing is human relation. The the head guy at the joint security area who ran the gym, very built guy. And he said to me, you got to eat. The first time he took me out, he ordered a bunch of food and he dumped multiple entrees. You have to eat. You have to lift heavy and progressively. And you have to do basic compound move. And he, he showed me. He showed me the way. That's how I put on muscle. And I learned a lot from him. And, you know, the whole philosophy, again, came from me shutting the fuck up and listening, you know, emptying my cup, you know, that old proverb, emptying your cup. And that's what I find the biggest issue with most people is they claim they love learning, but it's still with a cup that's still full, like, because they're so hodgepodgey, they're so all over the place that there's no humility to truly yeah. experience it and to truly go through it. Like, you know, they go to, you know, an RKC cert and the PRI course and then the never long enough to actually implement them. So what good is all that? You know, you learn this block or you learn this punch, but you never, you never drill enough that you can actually use it in the ring or in the street or in your practice. They just use it as a trick to show their clients, Hey, I'm worth something because I keep learning a new trick to entertain you with, you know, and that's what I have. Right. But it's people, you know, I really 
to me, you know, statistically, I'm 47, so I'm already at the halfway point. So I don't want to waste the latter half of my life on people that aren't looking for an for a longer term relationship. I'm I'm not looking for drive by friends, business relationships, any of that. And and what's great about that is, you know, I recently was in on a Zoom call because I've been donating a lot of my time to people who are struggling because the gyms are closing, jujitsu schools are closed, you know, uh, you know, gyms are closed. So this one gym owner from Chicago, we were doing a Zoom call and it's got a lot of baseball players. And I'm listening to all these guys with you know, doctors of physical therapies and trainers and really smart guys just talking about like, this is what we should prescribe baseball players at home while they're in quarantine to do this, this. I'm listening to all this stuff. And I, I wait and I basically summarize this. I was like, why don't we just do this, guys? Baseball players do one of three things. They throw, they feel, they hit. That's it. And they're like, what? I was like, so I gave them a matrix of like, let's do this and rotate from here. Let's do this and scoop, rise and, and throw. And let's, they're like, that's so simple. It's like, yeah, but everything in a fire, stop, drop, and roll is what you tell people to do. All the acronyms to clear a weapon of all the military people I trained are simple things because when you're under pressure, you're not going to be able to fathom all that, you know, stuff we'll call a proximal distal trend and all this. You're a fucking trainer, bro. Nobody gives a shit if you could identify the super infospinitis, so, you know, and all this internal rotation. I, I hate when people coach like that because unless their client is of that ilk, you know, and, and usually it's just other trainers. It's not, it's, you know, to sound fancy. Exactly. That's, that's people trying to convey how much they know. Yeah. I never use these anatomy type phrases ever when I taught a course and all yeah. that. <laughs> and I, says, I mean, it's human nature that if you hear a word that you don't understand, now your brain just shuts off and now you're not going to hear the rest of what I just said because you're so focused on, oh, what does he mean by that? Right. And a lot of people, they don't want to be like, oh, what do you mean, sir, by that? Because they don't want to be on blast or they don't want to put themselves on the spot. That's exactly right. Oh, I want to I want to emphasize one point of what you made here. A lot of people are looking for validation when they get into something. So they want not only do they want to make a lot of money, but they want to they want to interact with certain people and have their respect because right. like so and so likes me, now I'm somebody. Right. What you had growing up is you were around a lot of legitimate badasses already. Yeah. So you weren't eager. You, you, it wasn't something where you're going I need to meet some legitimate badasses or I need the respect of legitimate badasses to further my career because you already had that. And I think a lot of people, especially men, there's a lot of posturing of, I want to come off tough. Yeah. I want to come off this way because that's what I need to do for these other people to respect me. Right. And I've met some real badasses in life and they're not trying to make you act that way. It's you putting it on yourself. Yeah. Sometimes it even happens to me where people need, they feel like, oh, you know, Mike's such an aggressive guy and all that. I don't want to come off like a wuss around him. So they feel like they have to step up their game and all that. And I go, you don't have to do it. When I see people doing that. I go, you don't have to do that. Yeah. That's why when people meet me in person, I'm still who I am, but I'm, I'm a low key guy. Like if you come over to one of my group workouts, no one's going to be made fun of there. Yeah. Sometimes people think like, oh, you know, I don't want to show up because I'm not as strong as those guys and they're going to make fun of me. I was like, nobody is going to do that. Because strong men and strong women, they don't do that. Right. They're the most generous, helpful people you'll ever meet. Yeah. So this group was always about everyone's helping each other out. Yeah. So no one felt diminished or felt that they weren't worthy to be there. And I don't want anyone to feel that way. But what I do want is your best effort. I don't care how strong you are, Correct. but don't bring some dipshit, wussy-ass mentality when you come right. here. Don't be standing around with your arms folded going, oh, I don't know what to do. Or like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. No, 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 no. Your mindset has to be a strong one. You come here and you step it up because we're all going to step it up. And you know what? Everyone steps it up anyway because when you're in that environment, it happens. You don't want to be the one person. When I trained at Mark Phillippe's gym, I stepped it up because mm -hmm. I'm there with professional athletes and high school girls doing a dozen pull-ups like it's nothing and kids sprinting. I remember one time I sprinted with these high school guys and all I saw was them running in front of me because yeah. – Trying to run as fast as I can. I don't even think I'm moving. All I'm seeing is three guys way in front of me. They keep getting further away. Yeah. And there's Mark Phillippe just randomly picking up a heavy weight like it's nothing just for the hell of it. Yeah. So that that's and, and but no, but he's not he's not diminishing anyone in there. He's not putting anyone on blast unless your effort is not there. The only time I would see Mark take someone aside is when their effort was half assed. I remember one time he took this kid aside. He goes, 
You don't get strong by half-assing it and get better at anything by putting in such a minimal effort. It's like, now get back out there and do better, right? Like, and I was like, wow. That, and like you said, it was economy of language. It was five or six words, and he just put this kid right back out there, and it switched. You, I think you said it in a post recently in Instagram. It's, it's disrespectful. It's disrespectful yeah. to ask for someone's advice and not take it and apply it. See, right. that's why, like... So, <laughs> and I run into that. It happens so much. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's very common. Yeah. Because, again, of this, this culture, that's why, right. you know, we're more selective with who we associate. We, we purposely project that. It's funny, you know, I, I saw that interview with Mark Philippi, and I thought it was great because Thank I know you, you trained with him. And uh, I know he's good friends with Eddie Cohen because, you know, yeah, he and he gives him a lot of credit. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm fortunate enough, I, I feel I call Eddie a friend as well. Very Because, cool. And again, how do I know? I mean, look, look at, you know, I have the bone structure of like a teenage, you know, Japanese girl. Like I, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, that's, yeah. that's not my forte. It's funny. I'll tell you a funny story just to give you an idea what type of human being he is. And to your point about how these macho, like the greatest powerless of all time, some of the strongest men, they, there's a humility about them. There's a sincerity about them because they have that strength. So prior to this quarantine, you know, Facebook uh, marketplace, has all these used equipment because like if I needed extra plates, you know, for my own, you know, workout, like hundred pound plates or 45 pound plates, I find them on marketplace because people are just looking to get rid of them and it never, you know, weights never right. devalued. Right. So, right. so, and I know the value of what weights go for. So I'm like, Oh, geez, you know, <laughs> if, I can, if I have to drive 45 minutes, I'm going to go pick up these plates, you know, so right. I'm, especially, I'm, especially post pandemic. Now weights are worth like gold. People are going right. to pay $500 for a 35 pound kettlebell. <laughs> correct. Correct. So, there was this gym, the pit gym, uh, you know, in New Jersey, run by this young lady, Gina Gerard, and she was getting, you know, she was expanding, so she's getting rid of this preacher bench. And normally, I'm not like a biceps kind of guy, but just for posterity's sake, because I didn't know Larry Scott. He's the one, Mr. Olympia, that I don't know personally when he was alive, but he influenced me a lot because the one concept that I learned is the fact of how important the wrist strength has a lot to do with the shoulder position, which is what elicited his bicep development aside from genetics which we talked about earlier before we even started recording so i focus on the two percent you can control meaning when athletes come to me and go well 98 percent it's genetics and this i'm like all right let's focus on the two percent did you maximize right. your sleep did you maximize your hydration your training and when i focus on that they're like no i'm like well, let's focus on that and that's why I, I i teach people so i've gotten a lot of results because i feel like because so many people who are not competing at an elite level are needlessly using straps. They never develop good grip strength to correlate with their shoulder integrity. Because, you know, even from hanging from a bar, if you start losing your grip, you start losing position of your shoulder, right, in relation to your torso. So that's, right. that's one thing I learned. So just to preface, she was selling a, a preacher curl. And normally I don't get excited, but it was such a heavy piece and an old-fashioned piece. I don't know who made it, but... It's, you know, concave versus convex. Like, Larry Scott's whole thing is it shouldn't be flat. You know how most preachers are flat, like they're angled. His whole thing is should, it should puff out, right? The reason why it should puff out is it should be super padded so you could coil and pull the elbows in so you can really dig to lever and drop your shoulder and not keep your shoulder elevated, right? That was his thing. So because I found that piece on... Uh, Facebook marketplace. I'm like, I, I got to have this just to have it. You know what I mean? Because I have his last forearm wrist bent because he was selling equipment custom made. And they're like, the one guy on the phone goes, you know, I think we might actually have one, you know, that already pre-made. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, it actually might be Scott's and it Larry's, you know, and I was like, really? And what we later found out is when he passed away, he suffered from Alzheimer's. So he didn't use the equipment. You know, he had obviously was using it. So he had used it at least once. I, I know that for sure, you know, but so I actually have Larry Scott's wrist curl bench. Wow. In my house, right? Wow. That's really so, cool. Yeah. So it's, it's cool nostalgia, right? Like, it's like, yeah. it's like having an old kettlebell, right? Yeah. So no, cool. I go to this powerlifting gym with my buddy with a truck to go pick this up. She's like, it's heavy. You're going to need two people to move. I said, all right, I go in, I'm happy to be wearing like a, like an eight man shirt. And she goes, Oh, you a powerlifter? I said, no, not, not at all. She goes, why do you have that shirt? I was like, Oh, I'm just friends with <laughs> and, and she goes, she looks at me real skeptical because I'm sure a lot of people get in line at the Arnold and take a yeah, picture yeah. with them. And, and I'm all this, right? <laughs> so she goes, 
yeah, okay. And she's a young, young lady. And she goes, she goes, you know, I've been trying to get him here for a seminar forever. I said, would you like me to reach out to him? You know? And she's like, you could tell the skepticism. Like, she's kind of like, you know, like, what's my angle, right? Like, again, there's so much distrust. Like, what am I trying to get out of this, right? So I'm like, yeah, let me hit him up. So I hit up, and I'm like, text him. I'm like, tick, tick, tick. I go, would he know you by your name? And she's like, no, he knows me by my Instagram handle. I go, what's your Instagram handle? She goes, <laughs> okay. So she tells me, I, and, and I said, I said, I reach out to him, and then we load the preacher curl, and then we go, I tell my buddy, I go, hey, lunch is on me. Thanks for letting me use the truck and, and helping me out wherever you want to go. We order food. By the time we sit down, I get a message from him. And he's like, yeah, no problem. Definitely do the seminar. I didn't know you lived out there. We'll hang out. We'll lift. You know, I said, best time to come during the summer. We got the beach, all this kind of stuff. So I want to say 15 minutes, 20 minutes between the text and the response. So I screenshot it and I send it to Gina. I let her know. <laughs> and she goes, two things. She goes, she goes, because he basically said, good, I need to bite you. I've, it's been a while since I bit you because he and I have trained martial arts before, before right? Yeah. So yeah. how many people, so I grabbed him one time and he bit me, right? My nipple, right? <laughs> so, so how many people can say the greatest power lift of all time is literally bitten them, right? So yeah, there is. she goes, I don't know what kind of weird stuff you're into. And I said, one of two things. <laughs> I said, Dina, number one, I'm a man of my word. Number two. I go, how many people can claim that the greatest power lifter of all time? Like, there's an inside, you know, uh, language or rap, right? She goes, true. And what I love is, you know, when it was my birthday, it, uh, Eddie reached out, wished me happy birthday. And then we were going back and forth. Hey, how you doing during the pandemic and all the nothing? He said one of the greatest things. He said, good, dot, 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 by choice. Which shows you why he's a champion, right? Because his mentality, right, is he, he, he takes control of what he can control. And yeah. To wrap this whole story back around, he didn't forget. He goes, don't worry. I didn't forget. He basically said, when this all lifts, I'm going to see you in Jersey. I'm going to, I'm going to hit. I told, he reached out to Gina just to assure her when this quarantine stuff lifts, he's going to honor his word and come out to her gym and do a seminar. So like, it, you want to talk about what type of human being he is as a, you know, like he honors his word. He didn't forget. You know, all that, that kind of stuff. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. That's, you know, that to me, like this morning I woke up, I messaged somebody who's a multiple time, Mr. Olympia, and he, 15 minutes, I get a response. Like, I feel honored that the people that I looked up to now consider me a peer or even a subject matter expert on something that they regard and respect. Yeah. And that's, that to me is worth more than any amount of money. And then more so the Marines that I help who are currently stationed in Baghdad guarding the embassy that I talk to every day that I send like, I would go to the store and buy all these most stuff Oreos and people are like, Oh, somebody likes Oreos. I'm like, I'm actually <laughs> sending it to my guys, you know, in, in Afghanistan. They're like, Oh, and then their tone changes, right? First they're judgy, you know, and then they're like, Oh, that's so great. So nice of you and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, but, and people don't realize that, even this one guy, Joshua, stationed in Osan Air Force Base, is talking about something from Trader Joe's. I go, do you want some of that? He goes, yeah. I sent him a whole box of it. He's like, there you go. Boom. Give me your address. Because I do, just like you, we do a lot of stuff behind the scenes that we don't promote to support change. And considering what's going on in the world, it's not about posting about it and a hashtag. It's about living it and devoting. And I tell people, I've had people say, well, I don't make much money. I said, you know, when I made $300 in a paycheck before taxes, I still donated $10, $30. So that was a huge part of my paycheck to causes I believed or Special Olympics or to make sure. So then, you know, you know, 30 bucks became 300, 300 became 3000. And, you know, how great was it to support a whole Special Olympics team to train? Because I know their trainer and they needed a, a facility to train and, and, and the membership. And I was happy to do that. Those kinds of things that never make it to social media. And to me, that's why what used to be my ego, why is it so-and-so tagging me for teaching them a breathing drill, the pettiness in me to, this is actually my advantage. This is why people reach out to me because they have my confidence. They know that it, it's not about a circle jerk game for me. And also the fact that people are copying you is because your material is exceptional. Otherwise they wouldn't bother. I mean, if no one's ripping you off, you probably don't have that much good material. And it it's actually a sign that you have great material that people are ripping you off. I'm like, oh, really? That person took my DVD and they ripped it off and they're trying to sell it in China? Good. 
must have thought it was a good video. And then whoever watches that's going to find out about me. So it's going to circle back to me anyway. So why, why should I waste my time trying to block that? Uh, I've, I, I have a similar attitude that you do now. Earlier in my career, yeah, I, would, too. I would be like, man, this person ripped me off. Or one time Frank Shamrock came to one of my seminars and a couple other RKCs that were local. I invited them to come out just to, just to be there for exposure for them for in case any of my students locally wanted to further their, further their kettlebell training. And I can say with confidence that I'm the one who got Frank Shamrock into kettlebell training. I know that for a fact because the first time I spoke to him, he never heard of kettlebells. Yeah. And I introduced him to it. I talked to him about it. He came to my course. He didn't take the course, but he, he jumped in a couple times and tried out things, and he really liked it. He gave me the thumbs up. And I remember that was one of those surreal moments because I was such a big Frank Shamrock fan at that, at that time. Just to meet him and get that kind of validation. I'm hanging out with him in his office after work talking. It was really cool. But some of these RKCs worked with Frank because he wanted someone local to work with for a, an upcoming fight. And that's all fine and good. I don't yeah. mind. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had them come out to the course. But they wrote an article for Dragon Door talking about, oh, you know, Frank came to us because he wanted to learn how to do kettlebell training. In other words, they didn't give me any credit whatsoever. They didn't yeah. tell the whole story. It was purposely written in a way that Frank sought them out, and yeah. they're the ones who taught him. Now, they did train him for the fight. That part's right. true. But he never would have met them if it wasn't for me inviting them to that course. And I'm the one who already got him into kettlebell training. So he was already yeah. sold on kettlebells. He wasn't going, okay, let me try this kettlebell stuff out. Yeah. So it really bothered me at the time. Sure. It doesn't really bother me that much anymore because I don't really care about stuff. Especially when I go, I go, I go, well, how's my life? Does my life suck as a result of this? And the answer is usually right. no. Right. So who cares? It doesn't really matter. You know, when I, when I spoke to Mark, Mark brought up a story where there's this Ed Cohen deadlift program that's been circulating for a long time, right? There's a million YouTube clips about yeah. the Ed Cohen deadlift program. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that Mark is, lar Mark is largely responsible for writing that program for Ed. Now, they collaborated on it, but it was definitely more Mark, Mark's input than Ed's. And I knew it was Mark's program the first time I saw it because I trained with him. And I go, all these, uh, all these assistant exercises have his blueprint on it. I go, Mark, and I know Mark's friends with Ed. So right. without even talking to Mark, I'm like, oh, Mark definitely has something to do with this program because this is what he does. High volume and a lot of assistance work in this format and the way things were organized. Right. So I asked Mark on that call a couple of days ago. I go, does it bother you that so many people are out there talking about this Ed Cohen program and you never get credit? And he goes, nah. He goes, I don't care. He goes, if it wasn't for Ed, I wouldn't even be where I'm at. And he goes, Ed even said, you know, I tell people about this. He's like, that's all fine and good. Mark said he's so fortunate to have met Ed early in his career because Ed is the one who got him into powerlifting and got him into strongman training and helped him get a, a job at UNLV. Wow. So Mark feels that if it wasn't for Ed, he wouldn't have all these things. And he speaks openly about this. This wasn't a private conversation. Yeah. He gives Ed all the credit in the world. And what's, what's funny is I'm listening to Mark talk about how fortunate he feels having yeah. met all these amazing people. That's the way I feel about him. The fact that I was able to become friends with him because it started with I rented out his facility to do a couple of events. Then I came up with this video idea. I go, hey, how about I come out there and, and train with you? I'll pay you for four months and make a video out of it. He goes, you don't have to pay me. We'll just split the profit on the video. I'm like, all right, that's cool. That was very generous too. And those yeah. months, I, I learned so I learned more in those four months than the last 15 years before it in terms of optimal. Oh, yeah. I have I, those DVDs, uh, by the way. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Mastering the power exercises is still on my website. But the video didn't capture the full intellect and, yeah. it, that, I mean, just the, the presence and the intellect and knowledge of Mark Philippi, unfortunately, it wasn't captured on that video. Yeah. Not until you're there and you yeah. see him working with people and how he manages chaos so well where he's in this facility where all these different things are going on at the same time. And he can come over to me and say, hey, Mike, do this on squats. Hey, you, do this on the bench press. Yeah. You, make sure you, you you pull your shoulders down when you're doing pull-ups. You, you need to do this. Yeah. You, when you do box jumps, land this way. And he does it like a drop of a dime. Yeah, He's a funny guy too, man. He's hilarious. I mean, one time I was talking to two guys. I was about to do squats, right? There was two guys with me. And we're sitting there talking about movies. We're like, oh, this movie's lame. This movie's great. And then Mark comes in and he just goes, you know what's really lame, guys? We're like, oh, what's that? Two guys standing around waiting for one guy to squat. 
<laughs> I'm the guy that was supposed to be squatting, and these two guys are waiting. And I was, I was like, oh, okay, Mark, I get it. You just made me feel like a dipshit, which I deserve. So That's let me awesome. do those squats. Let me right. shut up and do those squats. But he said it in, in a funny way. He's not trying to yeah. be spirited. Right. He's just a real matter of fact guy. Yeah. And there was a, a really funny story. Is one time a bunch of us were training, and all of a sudden. Like this, this, this horrific smell starts permeating. And Mark does this. He puts his shirt over his head. He's like, what happened? Who did that? So someone farted, and it was the most nasty fart ever. Now, I was a little bit of a down, downwind of it, so it didn't really affect me. But all I saw was Mark putting his shirt over his head. And then this guy, Dale Hart, right? Dale Hart used to be a fighter in the UFC, and he trained over at Mark's gym. Dale, Dale goes, oh, sorry, guys. That was me. And Mark was so apoplectic about the whole thing. He's like, you know how disrespectful that is? You got three guys over here trading, and you let that go. You go outside with that, right? He, I've never seen him so mad. His face was like, looked like it was ready to explode. I wish I had moments like that caught on camera for the video because that's what people didn't see. People didn't see the sense of humor, the coaching ability, just, yeah. the, just the big persona he has because he's a low-key guy. But yeah. he... he He's a low key guy, but he turns it up at the drop of a dime. Like I was actually really surprised because he and I had had private conversations, but I didn't really get the full extent of his personality until I started working with him. Yeah. And just his ability to handle such a wide variety of personalities, it's it's really good. And it even even handle people that come at him with just stupid stuff, like his yeah. ability to just be calm. One time a guy came into his office, he and I were chit-chatting, and this guy's like, hey Mark, and this guy had like six beers that day. I mean, he's a like, daytime drunk he's like hey mark you know my kid needs to be doing more plyometrics and he needs to be working on this and mark just looks at him waits for him to finish stop talking and he goes so you're trying to tell me how to do my job right now and the guy's like oh no 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 you know i'm just uh i'm just uh you know just sharing my input he's like yeah i don't really need your input <laughs> you know here's a world when renowned strength yeah. with an elite strongman training background a high-level powerlifting background, and he taught at the university level, has trained professional athletes from all over the world. And here's a guy who couldn't touch his toes if his life depended on it, yeah. who's probably never worked out in his life, yeah. who actually has the audacity to tell Mark what he should be doing. I was, I, I was even though, if, like, if someone told me that story third party, I would have been like, nah, that couldn't have happened. But I was oh. in the office while it was happening. I saw it happen in front of me, and I was shocked. I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And if I were him, I'd probably be like, you know, get the fuck out of my office, man. Don't come in here and say this. It would just come out. That's just my personality. Right. But Mark's ability to just stay really calm, but yeah. also be very direct with, yeah. I'm not going to tolerate that, where the other guy got it. And it didn't lead to some confrontation where it was hostile and all that. That's that's a really gifted coach. And I, I think if if more people saw this this full spectrum of Mark's abilities, I think people would be lining up outside of his gym. I mean, there would be a long line of people trying to get in to be around him because until you experience that, you don't get it. Yeah. Hey, I'd, I'd like to meet the guy. It, 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 it tells well, you the in town, man. I'll take you over to meet him for sure. Definitely. Definitely. We're definitely doing definitely do that. But I think what's really key here is, you know, you and I can be very blunt <laughs> in my older age. What I've been working on, is not compromising, changing the message. My message is still the same, but I'm changing the tactics. I'm always willing to change tactics if they're not effective. And that's what I'm noticing because we have a different generation of people, right? People who are learning through different mediums. So right. I'm willing to adapt. And that's where, even though I was raised kind of old school, I don't train people the way I was raised because it's very different, right? It's a different time, different culture. Um, so... I do what's best for my client because that is what I'm, who I'm in service to, you know? Yeah. And I think what's really key is the sanity that most people, whether they're getting paid a ton of money, or whether it's training, is they compromise that. They compromise their values and their beliefs. And that's what I don't believe. When people start reaching out to me for business advice, I'm like, I don't have an MBA. I, I know nothing when it comes to business in the conventional sense. But when people are like, no, you're known for not compromising. You're known for not advertising. You're not, yes. Yes, those things I can help you with in terms of word of mouth, in terms of all that. Like, you know, talk about T Nations. Like, I remember reading, you know, all of Chad Waterbury's work and, you know, having right. his books and so forth, being a fan to the point that he and I are now, you know, very good friends and we've taught seminars together and 
you know, right. you know, like that we hang out and eat and he's introduced me to a ton of people. I'll tell you a very apropos story is we were doing a seminar and on the second day there was a guy and, you know, who walked in late and he was like, and he's a muscular guy kind of leaning against the wall and some people knew him and we tag team. So I would teach and then I would tag Chad and Chad go, Hey, here's my buddy. So-and-so I'm like, Hey, how are you? And he goes, he's from your neck of the woods. You, sh-, you know, I was like, Oh really? So I'm super polite. I'm like, Hey, from New York. He goes, yeah, I'm moving out to LA. I go, why are you moving to LA? I go, why not? I was like, okay. And I obviously knew Chad introduced us for a reason. So I'm trying to make talk and maybe we should get together next time you're out. He's like, yeah, I'm busy. I'm like, all right, this guy's a douchebag. You know, Chad came back, tagged me and I started teaching. As I was teaching, I noticed him talking to Chad and this guy realizing, oh, this guy isn't just some guy. He's presenting. He's co-presenting with Chad, right? And I felt this a lot when it came to martial arts. I had a lot of people who treated me a certain way and then they found out, oh, my grandfather was this person or, you know, and I never played that nepotism card. In fact, if anything, my, my family treated me worse just to make a point that they didn't give me a favor, basically, right? So he basically introduced me to this guy. And what's funny is at the end of the seminar, I remember this kid, Justin Fung, who basically uh, was there for Chad Waterbury. And he was like, who the fuck is this guy? But he's like, hey, can I have your uh, email and contact him? I said, absolutely. And I still keep in touch with him every once in a while. He, he's got a degree in horticulture and he lives with his dad. Like, it's not, it's not a fitness personality. Like, you know, yeah. he's not going to further my career is what I'm trying to say. Illustrate. Right, right, but, right. But I'm very open to communicating. And afterwards, behind him was that gentleman with his business card. And he was the editor of one of the most popular magazines at the time, right? And so the next day at brunch, Chad and I are having breakfast. And I go, bro, I go, your buddy the other day, douchebag. I said, <laughs> don't. And I said to him, this is what I said to him. I said, don't ever introduce me to a guy like him again. I, and he said, but, and I get Chad's intent was pure. It was like, he could do a lot for your career. I just wanted to, he just wanted to help me. He was trying to facilitate help. And I said, let me ask you this. I go, I know there are a lot of talented people out there. Just like we talked about, fools can say the wisest thing. They can be assholes, but still have value, right? Like in terms of we can learn something. And that's where our humility needs to come. But what I said to him was, who has that ability, but is also a good person that I would want to spend time with? And when he thought about it, he only could name like five people. And he called one of those people right away and the guy was out of town. But those people that he mentioned, I've met all of them except for one now. And, and I'm friends with all of them now. And that's what I'm looking for. Just like you talk about Mark Phillippe. It's like, I'm not interested in adding to my resume of, you know, because I have that. Like, I could show you my, my phone. Right. That's not the issue. The issue is the, the quality, the caliber and the tact that Mark has. Like, I want to be around people like that, like Eddie Cohen, who just flew in from a seminar at Brussels and still took the time to respond to me within 15 minutes. Right. Like that's just insane. Right. Like that really proved to that young lady that I knew. Do you know what I mean? You know, and for Mark to handle some guy six beers deep and just to talk to him that way, I think you and I, I can definitely speak for me. I definitely can learn a lot from that. And that's why even the, the Mr. Olympia that I spoke to today, he talks to every, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot about tact. So, because I want, I believe in the message so much that I want it better delivered because I wanted it so bad. I would get so frustrated. I would tell people, I would like some lube before you try to stick it up my ass. That's how <laughs> abrasive I am with people. Yeah. And I realized that these guys are doing this. They're saying yeah. the same thing. Mark's saying the same thing. Eddie Cohen saying the same thing. All these guys are saying the same thing, but they're saying it in a way that is more palatable and gets the message across better. And that is something. Yeah. That they're think- confusing the situation too, right? Because okay. if Mark, gets all mad at this guy and this guy's especially a couple drinks in right. now he's gonna get mad back now he feels like he has to posture back even right. though he's, he would get his ass kicked handily right. Right. right but these guys are still gonna try to pod like well i'm gonna get my ass kicked i'm gonna try to look like i'm tough getting my ass kicked right. not cower and all that so he defused that really effectively and mark made a good point too he talked about a a well-known strength coach i won't name drop but he said that his assessment of the strength coach was He's really cool to me, mm. but when I see him interact with other people, often he's really rude and mean spirited to them. So I don't like that. You know, just because he's cool to me doesn't mean that he's a good person. 
I'm looking at how he's interacting with other people. And I go, that's a really good point. Because sometimes people, if someone's cool to them, they just give them a pass and everything else they do. It's like, well, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm friends with Harley Flanagan of the Chromex, and I don't know if you are familiar with the Chromex. Yep, yep. But there was a lot of drama between Harley and the original lead, or not the original lead singer, but the most well-known lead singer of the Chromex, John Joseph. Okay. Now, I used to be friendly with both guys because John's always been cool to me. So I never have anything negative to say about him on a personal level. Harley and I, though, have been friends since 2002. I actually met him through the business because I was always such a huge fan of his. I sent him some information on kettlebell training, and he and I just hit it off. I said, you know, you're so, you made such a big impact on my life. I wouldn't be vegan if it wasn't for you because yeah. you wrote about vegetarianism, and this, I wouldn't have gotten into religious studies because you were talking about Hinduism and all that. Your music had such a big influence. And he's like, wow, man, that's great to hear because, you know, I've done so many horrible things in my life that sometimes I wonder if, if I've had any positive impact. So it was nice for him to hear that. And we built, we built a really good friendship after that. So anyway, John and Harley are always, they're basically enemies for lack of a better metaphor, but I'm cool with both guys. So I always tried to stay out of that. I go, I, I don't really want, I don't really feel a need to pick a side because that's between the two of them. Now back in, oh, when did this happen? It was maybe 2012 or 13. There was this infamous, incident that happened where John was playing with his version of the Chromag, so basically a new band, and Harley's not involved, even though Harley owns the trademark where you know, legally no one else can train, but he wasn't taking it to that point. So anyway, John's playing at this event with his version of the Chromag. Harley feels that he wants to put an olive branch out. He goes, I don't want to uh, uh, life is too short for us. We're old men and we can't figure this out. You know, why can't we put, why can't we just bury the hatchet and just find a way to move forward in a positive manner? So he went there with that intention. Now I'm telling it from his side of the story. There's other sides of the story sure. as well. So we don't really know what the full truth is. Only the people in the room that I'm about to get into know, but Harley's a good friend of mine and I don't see why he would lie about this, especially to me. So anyway, he says that he was invited backstage by a few other people in John's circle and that when he went backstage, all of a sudden the door shut behind him and he got jumped and the punches are coming down and people are kicking him and all that. Now Harley's a first or second degree black belt under Henzo Gracie in jujitsu and he's a legitimate badass even before that. So Harley used all of his training as well as, as being a street guy as well as his yeah. martial arts background. You know, he survived that. And he, he stabbed one guy, he bit another guy, he put people in the hospital to survive that. So he didn't, he felt like these people were trying to kill him. And he's thinking about, I need to survive this so I can see my sons again and so forth. So anyway, he gets, a, he get the, the, eventually this, this whole thing is broken up and the police arrive, medics arrive. Harley is taking in a stretcher because he's been stabbed, he's injured and so forth. He gets to the hospital and I think he might have been unconscious for a while. When he wakes up, he's or he's handcuffed because now the narrative has been from the people that were there that Harley came back there by himself and started attacking people. Yeah. And Harley goes, why would one guy go into a room full of people and start attacking them? Yeah. yeah. Also, why would I risk going to prison for right. who knows how long and be taken away from my kids right. for nothing? And they're trying to paint a narrative that this guy's bitter. He's angry that the band has moved on without him. The band can't move on without him because he owns the trademark. Yeah, legally, absolutely. So anyway, he ends up going to Rikers for a little bit mm. during this whole thing. And he, long story short, he and he gets out of there. The 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 the, the charges against him are dropped because when. The DA interviewed all the people that were in the room. The story kept changing. So they were fighting the consistency. Yeah. And then nobody wanted to testify under oath either. Mm. So they realized, okay, we don't have a case here. So they just dropped it. And that's the end of the story. Now, even after all of that, yeah. Harley, I don't think he cares now because now he's back. He, he just came out with a new Chromex record literally last night or the night before. So he's moved on with other people. He's not trying yeah. to reconcile with John at this point. But even for years after that whole thing went down, he was still trying to reconcile with John, which makes yeah. me believe his side of the story even more. Yeah. Because 
I mean, I found it amazing that I go, why would you try to reconcile with John after what happened to you? Yeah. That's because I'm still a nostalgic guy and I know a lot of people would enjoy it. And it would just show the hardcore community that, you know what, if these two assholes can work it out, then, you know, maybe we can work it out with people in our lives that we've had falling outs with. Yeah. So he was thinking on it on a really deeper level. But he's painted as this pariah in the hardcore community. For example, yeah. I put I put up a I put up a I put up a Instagram post with a screenshot of the new record, and a bunch of people liked it, but no one in that hardcore community liked it. Mm -hmm. And I'm friends with people in the hardcore community, but they're all they're all on John's side, or at least they feel like they have to be on John's side. So they feel like, oh, if I like this post and John finds out, he's going to get mad. Harl John discommunicated. John basically doesn't talk to me anymore because I've had Harley on the podcast. And even though I was diplomatic, I didn't sit there. I even said on the episode, I go, look, I'm friends with both of you guys. And Harley's like, you know what, Mike, you can try to spin this any way you want, but here's what happened. Right. And I was like, wow. You know, I, so, I, so after Harley told me his side of the story, I, I felt like I really needed to pick a side here because that's mm -hmm. fucked up. Now, if, I, if I'm friends with the guy, if you, me, and another guy are all friends, and then you have a falling out with that other guy, but I'm still friends with that person, but if you tell me that that guy tried to potentially kill you or at least kick your ass severely, I can't be friends with that other guy anymore, even if that person's cool with me. That's just the way I look at it. Right. So I, I don't have anything personal to say bad about John. I've never had a bad experience with him. It's always been positive. And he put me in his book, and he's always been very nice to me and all that. But that doesn't mean that I can just be okay with this whole thing. Right. Now, some people can say, Mike, you don't know what happened. You weren't in the room. And that's true. I don't. Right. But I'm closer friends with Harley than any of these other people. And there's no reason, in my opinion, for him to lie to me about this whole thing or to lie about it anyway. Now, maybe that's just me being naive, but that's just my feeling. I'm a pretty good read of people. I know when people are bullshitting me for the most part. And that's just not my read on this whole situation. And the fact that... Well, anyway, you know, I won't keep harping on this, but it, ju it just shows you it, sh it shows you the complexity with your integrity and whether you're going to compromise it or not. Because a lot of people, even if they know someone's in the wrong, they don't want to take a stand against that person because they feel like this person has a lot of power and might, he can make trouble for me. There may be negative repercussions of me even speaking this openly. So they choose to just not pick a side. Sometimes in life, you have to pick a fucking side. Yeah. That's just a reality. You can't be cool with everybody all the fucking time. You have to decide this isn't right. And I'm not going to align with that person anymore. And I'll deal with the fucking consequences. This is what you have to do. And when I left the Dragon Door community in 2006, it wasn't as dramatic a situation, but I wasn't happy anymore. I wasn't happy in the direction they were going. I wasn't happy with my role in where they were going. Hmm. I, I mean, I, I didn't play a role in where they're going, but just my position in the company as they're going yeah. in the direction. So I decided that I can't be a part of this anymore. And I remember my brother's like, oh, you know, your, your career is just blowing up now. You're starting to make good money. You got a lot of support from them. Are you sure you want to do it? Yeah. And I, I was like, I don't have a choice. I was like, I can't do it. I'm not happy. I didn't get into this thing to, to end up not being happy again. I, I feel like now I'm right back to where I was when I quit my last job. So it's either it's either I stay miserable because it's the easy path to be in. You know, they they offered me a book deal at that time. They offered who knows what kind of opportunities they would have offered me if I stayed on board. But I wasn't happy and I couldn't stay on board anymore. So I said Fuck it and I left. And I did it in a way which didn't compromise my integrity. I gave them several months. I told I told them why I want to leave and I told them I, I I'm not going to just drop the bar on you guys because I know I have a role in your organization. So I'm going to give you, an, uh, and by September 1, I'm going to make it official that I'm gone. So you have until then to replace me and come up with whatever narrative you want to come up with. To sure. spin. That's what I felt like I needed to do because Pablo did help me out a lot. So I, I, didn't, want to, I, didn't, I didn't want to just leave him empty handed and be like, fuck off. I'm not happy. So that's what ended, that's what ended up happening there. And when I first left, <laughs> I remember my income tanked. And I don't know if it was coincidental or because... I left the organization. I wasn't. I didn't have their support anymore. But it, yeah. it, it tanked. Yeah. And I was like, Fuck, man. I was like, I knew I was gonna take a hit, but not this much. But then I, I went into survival mode, which to me is thriving mode. Yeah. I put together a. Right. I put together a book fast. I wrote my aggressive strength solution for size and strength. Boom, got it out there. That started selling big time. All of a sudden, income's coming back. 
I started promoting a shitload of courses, massive action time. You know, I went back into like the, the mentality I had when I first started. It's massive action time because now you're going to find out whether you deserve to have this success. Are you successful because they did all the work for you? Or are you going to be successful because you're going to do all the work for yourself? Now you're going to find out. I pumped out a new video. Boom, it was my best-selling video ever. I pumped out a course with other guys. Boys are back in town. Me, Steve Cotter, Nate Morrison. Yeah. As well. We all did a video together. Boom, that video blew up. All of a sudden, I'm back in business. I'm back in the game. So it was a short period where I was in this no man's land of where am I going to go in my career and did I make the wrong move? I was like, no, you didn't make the wrong move. But maybe you relied on their assistance too much. Yeah. Now you're going to have to do what they did for you for your own. In other words, before people would go to Dragon Door, then they would find out about me. Now people are going to have to find out about you, period, without going there. Because they're not going to promote you anymore, obviously. And I don't expect them to promote me anymore. But one thing that a lot of people don't know is when I left, I told them to take all my articles down that I wrote for them. Because I didn't, I, I didn't want any help from them anymore in any way, even indirectly. And they're like, okay. <laughs> you know, they didn't know what I wanted to do with that. I go, because I'm not involved with you guys anymore. And I want it to be a clean break. I want people to know that. Now where you have a bunch of my content still on there and people are like, is he with them or is he not with them? Right. So, I mean, that, that was another one of those periods where you find out what you're made of. And that's why in that clip I put up today, I go, you got to welcome adversity. It's not enough just to be like, okay, you know, adversity is coming. I'm going to, I'm going to gear up for it. No, 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 no. You got to welcome adversity. You got to want adversity to happen because that's where the growth is going to come. It's not going to happen when everything is calm and everything is going great no growth happens during those periods. The growth happens when something happens dramatic. Your world is turned upside down. Adversity is in full effect. And you have to make a decision on whether you're going to blast through it or not. And if you're committed, you're going to blast right through it. I mean, you don't even have to make a decision. If you're committed, you're going to, you're going to welcome that adversity. You're going to go right through it. Yeah. If it's not a goal that's important to you, then you're going to cave. But it's not so much because of the adversity, but because the goal wasn't important. Uh, you know, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. You talk about all this kind of, you know, I grew up with that kind of, whether it be martial arts, whether it be kettlebell, any organization I've seen, a well-intentioned group of talented people get together. Yeah, yeah. And then there'd be issue, right? Yeah. And, and then it's amazing to see because individually when they break off, they all had successful organizations. It makes you wonder what they could have done collectively. Right? Yeah. And I've seen it in martial arts. I've seen it in training organizations. I've had very similar experiences where, you know, not only did I burn bridges, I burned down old goddamn villages. Started, <laughs> started from a fresh. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and with people who are heads of organizations that I knew their family. Once again, I'm, I'm sitting across right. from, you know, their wife, their kids, their cousins, you know, and all this stuff. And they're taking credit for for their cousin's development when I'm the one actually training them and all this kind of stuff. So I know what that's like, but what's interesting is how I've evolved. And I think this, this might be helpful to your audience is, is to simplify and summarize what you're really about. And I was in Madison square garden with one of my best friends, Gina, who's like I said, one of John Walsh former's clients. We've been friends for all these years and she wanted to go see the Christmas lights. You know, she'd never been to Rockefeller center in New York city, which is a big attraction. So we went, and one of my dear friends, he's like a little brother, he, he had a Muay Thai fighter at Madison Square Garden. So we went and watched best seats in Madison Square Garden, right behind the ring cart girls. They're sitting right down there. And um, sure enough, when the fight ended and his guy was a headliner, he came up to me because he was walking back with his fighter and his fighter won. And he introduced me to this guy, Danny Bill, who's a living legend. He used to fight uh, Roman Deckers. He's one of the first foreigners to ever fight in front of the king of Thailand and win, you know, be a foreigner and win, you know, defeat a Thai. And if you YouTube, his leg kicks are just devastating. Leg sweeps, just amazing, right? And knowing him now, it's mostly self-taught, you know, which is even more amazing, Yeah, to be honest with you. So, you know, my friend introduced us and, you know, he had bad hips and he's like, this is my friend Will and he's the best at what he does. So... Here you go. And then he ran. He left. <laughs> and then yeah. I didn't even get to see because he had to tend to his fighter. So I didn't even get to. I was going home after that. 
So Danny Bill was with this guy who was hosting for his, uh, him for a seminar. This guy Spider, S P Y D H D A H. I was like Spider. Okay, Spider. Big guy. And they were basically like, and it's crowded, and they're pushing us out. He's like, "What do you do, man? What what is it you do?" And again, I tell people this: you have to get good at communication because sometimes you only have thirty seconds to pitch, right? right. So I basically say, you know, martial arts is all about dismembering people, right? It's, whether it's psychologically, whether it's breaking someone's arm, right? Breaking someone's spirit by hitting them to the body, whatever. He goes, yeah. I go, I reverse engineer that to put people back together. Wow, that's so well said. And he's like, fuck. And he's like, well what you said. do? Yeah, he's like, what you doing tomorrow? I said, I <laughs> so right away, he invited me to meet him. He had two seminars that day in between his break. He goes, come up here. 12 o'clock, you meet me. I said, okay. So I drove up there. All the guys were leaving. I don't think the guy even thought I was going to show up because he was ready to walk out and go to lunch with the other guys. And I was standing there in the parking lot. And he's like, all right, let's go. He's jacked up. and He's got some hip issues. So I did an assessment of something simple on how to tie his shoes. And, you know, he had trouble. And so I showed him some drills. And he's like, oh, this is hard. I was like, is that how a champion builds a fucking championship <laughs> by going this is fucking hard and he's like, <laughs> he fucking hit his ego and i showed him a drill actually that talk about credit like someone like joe defranco when i gave him the drill and i said like I, like i told him do 100 of these and he's like bro i only did 30 he goes but my hips feel amazing i'm going to show this to triple h and stephanie mcmahon because i'm training them tonight and he openly said that on social media he openly like blasted right. it and said it and that, which i appreciate right so getting back to danny bill you know, and then I reassessed his ability and he was like, oh my God, that's amazing, right? So we started talking. So since then, he and I have become friends. So anytime he's in town, we get together, we go eat. And since then, we've talked about, you know, everything from religion to music to hip hop and all this kind of stuff. And my point being is that the most important journey and the most important enemy or obstacle towards your success is not other people, it's yourself. Yeah. And 100%. the character for martial in terms of martial arts, the Chinese character is Mu. And it's really sword and prevent so really martial arts is about neutralization or creating peace or balance however you want to interpret that so for me whether it's police and what's going on in this world whether it's race whether that's what i love because the only merit you have when it comes to deadlifting when it comes to rolling in a jiu-jitsu is is the merits that you've earned through sweat equity right and people who really love jiu-jitsu or love weight they don't give a shit what color where you came from how much money you make they give a shit that you worked your ass off from where you were to be where you currently are amongst these other people and that's what i think is the biggest thing that we're missing in our generation is no one is great anymore no one's specializing they're homogenized they're pc they're they're very bland and that's not what neutralization is what neutralization is is excelling like Mark Philippi, like Eddie Cohen, yeah. but being tactful enough to continue being who they are. Like, you know, Eddie's schedule to travel is just insane. All, like I said, when I reach out, oh, I'm just getting back from Brussels. Oh, when I, last time I saw him, he's like, oh, I'm heading out to Switzerland. I want to stay longer, but I, I got to catch a flight. It's like, you know, all right, you know. And so he is that much in demand. He is that busy. He just, you know, judged a, a bench uh, competition on ESPN today. So like, yeah. th that's how in demand this guy is, you know, yeah. even in his retirement you know oh, yeah. so my thing is you should really resource and tap the people who are busy doing what you want to be successful at as opposed to the people who spend an exorbitant amount of time with their instagram filters and their hashtags because if you look at my instagram profile i don't have a lot of followers i'm creeped a lot that i can tell you like like I'll, <laughs> I, I, before the quarantine i was out on a date and this super well-known guy on instagram like super like very popular I saw him and I was like, hey, and his black belt knew me and he hugged me and he's like, oh, didn't we know? And he goes, bro, what are you doing here? He goes, I, I live here. He's like, because we saw each other at the airport one time. I was like, bro, you live here? He's like, why don't you swing by the academy? Why don't you come train? Why don't you do this? So it, in front of the date, it made me look like a king because she was like, wow, this guy, you know, you really yeah. know a lot of people. Yeah. This kind of stuff. It's, <laughs> it's all bullshit. But my point <laughs> being is, yeah. he goes, he goes, man, you seem really busy these days. And this was pre-quarantine. It's like, how does he know that? Because he falls, even though he, they don't interact, he knows what the fuck I'm up to, just like right. all these other people do. And I appreciate, my whole thing is, I value you. I value the Eddie Collins, I value the Mark Philippines, and more importantly, my UPS guy, Tom Brown, and I chuckle because his last name is Brown, you know, 
the colors for UPS or Brown. So he years ago, when I first moved down here, he was my original UPS guy, and then he moved to a different route. He's now back on my route. And he was training with, uh, he was going to seminars for Randy Couture, Matt Lindland. You know, he went to a Brooks Kubrick seminar. He went, you know, he was big into Matt Fury and all these different yeah. people. And so I, I would do like, and again, no problem. He was just like, why am I shipping all this heavy equipment to your house? Like, you know, and doing all this stuff. And I was like, oh, I do a little something. And he would tell me who he was into. And I'd run upstairs, grab a book, and I'd give it to him. And he'd open the book. And whomever it was was like, to Will, thank you for helping me edit this book. To Will, thanks for all your feedback. He's like, what the fuck? And I had even books that never even made it to publication, like drafts of books, you know, that never even made it to publication that I just were looking at for fitness professionals. And he was just like, how do you know this fucking guy? I was like, who do you think trained him? Or who do you think showed him kettlebells? Or who do you think did this? So one time his back was all jacked up and he's just like, fuck my back. I was like, come in the garage. Let me take a look at you. We well, said, he goes, my back feels amazing. He goes, what do I owe you? I said, nothing. He goes, come on, I got to owe you something. I was like, nothing, bro. We're good. So I have his phone number. See, he always signs for stuff, even though he's not supposed to, and just puts it on my back deck and does all this kind of stuff. So I see him the other, like a week ago, and he's just, and he's not one to complain. He's super active, super fit. And he's just like, man, I'm getting running ragged. He goes, UPS is running me. Like, I, they want me to pick up another shipment. And it's like eight o'clock at night. Like, he want, he's like, they want me to unload another shipment. He goes, and it was unusual for him because he's not one to bitch, you know? So I was talking to him for a little bit because he's at my neighbor's delivering something. So last night or the night before, I texted him. It's like, hey, how you, how you doing? Oh, man. And we start talking. He goes, I have tomorrow off. I have this. And when I, I said, I was just worried because I saw you were stressed the other day. And he said, I really appreciate that. And he was telling me three years ago he started surfing. And he almost drowned last year. And to me, what the whole point of this story is, I don't care if you work at my local car dealership. I don't care if you're my UPS guy. I don't care if you're the greatest power lifter in the world. What I care about is how you treat people so that we can forge a relationship to seek excellence and it's as opposed to people who are just fleeting and drive by right. and fair weather because that's what I want in my life. I want longevity and whether it be – and to me, I tell people longevity, you know, you talk about anatomy. I have people who know nothing about anatomy, but they come up to me and they're like, what's this muscle? Because they feel their anatomy. So they're like, they can literally trace the line of the latissimus right. muscle and be like, what's this? And this is a 67-year-old man who, who knows nothing, you know, who grew up in Brooklyn. Like, he, what right. does he know, right? And I still have clients, a few, not a lot, that I've been with me for 20 years that still pay what they used to pay, not because I was afraid to ask for more money, because they believed in me when I was nothing and nobody, and they witnessed me travel the world and become very well known that even people who have, you know, infomercials and stuff, I know all them. And, yeah. and, and to them, they know that I charge 10 times that amount. Now they know that's what I make now. And I just do it out of loyalty. So how you treat people is longevity, how you treat your body, your relationship with your body, your relationship with the kettlebell. That's all teaching you about your sourcing of integrity, whether it be structural or character. And how well you interact with that 500 pounds, that kettlebell, that opponent or that right. person so right. that you are better servicing your community through example and through connection. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what's really important during these times. Yeah. You got to have structural integrity with your body. Then you got to have integrity with the way you work with people. Reminds me of John Davies a little bit. He was at that course that kettlebell service. Anyway, I developed a friendship with John Davies. And when I moved out to Los Angeles, he was very generous with – talking to me on the phone about things I need to do to make sure that I'm successful and that I protect my business and so forth. And we taught a course together very early in my career where there really wasn't any benefit for him to, to align with me at that point. I mean, this is months into my career. So I wasn't well established at all. And at that time, John was considered, he was very respected. He was, he was, emer I mean, he was, he had been teaching for a while, but he was emerging in the fringe mainstream fitness business, for lack of a better metaphor. Like he was all over T Nation. He was, he had book deals with Dragon Door, video deals with Dragon Door, the whole shebang. I don't know if the videos ever came out, but the books definitely came out. Yeah. Anyway, the so Renegade Row. That's when he re he introduced the Renegade Row at that time. Yeah, 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 exactly. The Renegade Row. He had this book for basically it was it was strength training for people that engage in extreme athletics, BMX people and skateboarders and surfers. It was really interesting. Yeah. What book? I mean, just crazy stuff that he demonstrated in there. But anyway, anyway, somewhere along the way, the narrative changed for him where he didn't become a pariah, but all of a sudden 
he's a wild guy and he's a crazy guy. So people started, he started losing people and people that had aligned with him when they thought it was self-serving all of a sudden disappeared. They're going, oh yeah, I'm going to, I want to, I want to be known to be one of John Davies guys or be friends with him because it helps me. But once, once the narrative on him started becoming negative, yeah. It wasn't because of integrity type things. It was, I don't know why, honestly. I would have to talk to him about it. I noticed that people started pulling away from that. Yeah. That's another thing I see too is when someone is hot in the presses, they want to align with that person. But when that person is no longer maybe relevant, people want to dis, they they want to distance themselves from that. And that's happened to me in my career too. Sure. When I was at the peak of my notoriety with Dragon Door, everybody wanted to be aligned with me. I mean, some people took shots at me because that was the other way for them to get attention is sure. like the stones at Mike and, you know, be a, be someone that's a distractor as right. a way to align. It's kind of like when some people say, oh, I like this and someone says something else just to not because they don't necessarily agree or disagree. They're just looking to detract from what the first person said. Once I left Dragon, all those people went away. All of a sudden, people didn't want to come to my workshops anymore. They want, they knew they were worried about being associated with me because they thought they would get flack from Dragon. <laughs> all of these people that were like, "Oh, I'd love to come out and assist your course, assist at your course." All of a sudden, they're gone. Yeah. These motherfuckers are gone, and I didn't care. I didn't want them at the course anyway. But all of a sudden, I noticed that the offers weren't there and all that. Yeah. And that, and then once I came back up where my, my career took a dip and then I came right back up. All of a sudden, yeah. some of people started coming back like, oh man, you know, I'm really happy to see all the success you've had on your own. And, uh, you know, if there's ever anything I can do to help you out. I was like, yeah, there wasn't anything you could do to help me out about eight months ago when you thought my career was over. Yeah. But now when you see me flourishing again, now you want to come back. And then same things happened when I was traveling all over the world teaching. And then when I decided to leave physical training altogether and focus on my supplement business, same thing. All of a sudden, like, well, you know, Mike's not traveling around teaching anymore, so he doesn't have anything to offer me. You know, I can't assist at his course or be aligned with him because he's not on that trajectory anymore. Yeah. And then the supplement business blows up, and now all of a sudden, some of these people start coming back, like, oh, I'd love to try your products. Well, then go buy it, motherfucker. (laughs) You and I aren't friends. I'm not going to just send you shit. You want to try my products? Guess what? Do what everyone else does who wants to try it. You go buy it. Right. (laughs) Is <laughs> so I, I see this opportunism behavior, and there really yeah. isn't anything to teach people who are like that because that's just who they are. They don't have integrity. You yeah. can't teach integrity to somebody. Integrity is something. I mean, you can teach it at a young age, but when someone's an adult and they're fully formed, you either have integrity or you don't. Yeah, it's either something that you think is important or it isn't. You either genuinely want to help people or you don't want to. I mean, that's not, that's, that's my take in the whole thing. So when I see these opportunistic type people, it's fuck off time. You know, right now things are going well for me. You want to be aligned with me. What's going to happen the next time things don't go well, you're going to yeah. disappear again. Yeah. And I see this in all kinds of industries too, not just ours, the music industry. All of a sudden, I mean, even Harley as another example, when, he, when I first met him, he was down and out. He didn't have anything going on music wise. He was struggling. He had a lot of personal life strife and I'm always like, man, so many people look up to this guy in other bands. How come no one's helping him? On one hand, no one knows what he's trying to do. So it's hard to help someone when they don't know what he's trying to do. But now you fast forward to now, he has a record deal. He's touring. People love the new record. It's a total day. And now all of a sudden, people are like, oh, yeah, man, great record. But where were these people 18 (laughs) years ago when he didn't have anything going on? Yeah, yeah. So it's just, I don't know what it is about some people in human nature, but this is a pretty common one. Another one is an L.A. story. A friend of mine was, he's friends with Van Damme and Mickey Rourke. And Mickey Rourke and Van Damme used to be roommates, and they were wild guys. They'd go out partying, they're snorting cocaine. You know, we make that joke about snorting cocaine off a hooker's ass. They're actually doing that, all right? <laughs> they're the ones who invented that properly. So anyway, this guy, Dan's his name. He's at the bar waiting for them to arrive. You're talking he, about Danny Hester? No, his name is uh, McCola, Dan McColgan. Yeah. So anyway, he turns to these women next to him and says, hello. And they look over at him and pff, they kind of laugh, They're like, who's this guy to even try to talk to us? Right. He's like, Jesus, man, that's some shallow shit. But that kind of stuff happens in LA all the time. Sure. Two minutes later, Van Dam and Mickey Rourke come in. They're like, hey, Dan, man, come and join us, man. Let's have a couple of drinks. Dan turns around to walk away. One of the girls taps him on the shoulder. She's like, oh, I'm sorry. What was your name again? <laughs> like, he's like, I didn't tell you my name. And then he just walked away, right? And then he was really mad. So Van Dam and Mickey Rourke are going, hey, man, what are you so mad about? He's, and he tells them the story. 
And, he, and then Van Damme and Mickey Rourke just being instigators. So they're like, dude, take this drink, man. Go throw it in your face. He's like, no, I can't do this. He's like, come on, man, do it, do it, man. It'll be great. We're not going to get kicked out. You're with us, right? And Dan's, Dan's a really high classy guy. So he's like, no, man, I can't do that. But they were just trying to get him to do that because they were <laughs> Like, who are these women that treat this guy like that, right? <laughs> so that's just – so sometimes when when people don't think you're someone, they treat you a certain way. And then something comes along sometimes a moment later, and they're like, oh, wow, you're somebody? Let me change my tune. That that says a lot about you it does. in terms of having no integrity. Yeah. Another example of that is I'm friends with Chris Pontius, right, Jackass movies? Okay. And when I say I'm friends with him, I mean, I'm, we're really friends with him. I filmed one of my videos in his backyard. I didn't just meet him once at a workshop. He came to yeah, one yeah. of the workshops and we developed a friendship. Yeah. So he told me he was at some some Hollywood function and the person at the door wasn't going to let him in. He's like, hey, man, you know, your name's not on the list. And he's like, well, here's he's like, well, it should be on the list and this and that. Anyway, someone else recognized Chris and he's like, hey, man, let him in. Let him in. That guy's that guy's my friend. Anyway, a few minutes later, whoever the door guy was found out that that's Chris Pontius from all the Jackass movies. So he went and he apologized to Chris, but it was a very lame apology. What he said is, oh, sorry, man, I didn't realize who you were. And he yeah. goes, it doesn't matter who I am. You should have been cooler than that. You should have been more polite instead of just Correct. dismissing me like I'm nobody, Correct. like I'm a homeless guy trying to get into this party. You know, you treated me like shit and you didn't have to do that. You could have been cool about it. Yeah. That was his you know, fuck off story. So I, I, I see this, this really petty behavior far too often. And what you're talking about, circling back to what you're saying, how people stalk you on social media, is they're looking at your page to see what you're doing. Yeah. But they don't want anyone to look at, they don't want anyone to know that they're right. looking at your page right. because somehow they think that if people find out about you, it's gonna take away from them. Correct. Why is giving people credit for things they taught you somehow take away anything from you? I don't get it. Because they're, they're not anchored in anything substantial. Everything no. of theirs is fleeting. It's filters. It's, it's someone else's material. There's no connection and there's no history. I mean, Mark Phillip, he taught me how to deadlift properly, right? He yeah. taught me this dip and drive. Yeah. Tom, I post a clip. I always mention him. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm doing this dip and drive. I'm more explosive off the floor. All credit to Mark Phillip. I want yeah. people to know that. Yeah. So if I were going to teach that technique at a course, I would preface it with that every single time. I wouldn't try to spin it where this is something I came up with. Right. And frankly, it's more impressive if I bring Mark's name into the equation because he's more impressive than I am physically by a long shot, especially in, in the context of the deadlift. Yeah. So the fact that I even know him and learned it from him, in my opinion, makes me look better because it shows yeah. that I'm willing to go out there and learn from the best rather than just being some egomaniac that doesn't think he can learn anything from anyone. Correct. So I don't get it. I don't get this this inability to give credit to people that have taught you things or have tried to help you out as if it's going to somehow take away from you. Uh, you, you know, well, first of all, I, I get it in the sense that, you know, in traditional martial arts, you know, in Korean, they call Rupar lineage, right? It's just like right. dog breeding or anything. If you have if you show dogs, right, you want right. to show the breeding lineage of a horse, right. a dog. Same thing. If you claim to teach Pilates, you should be able to say that you learn from somebody who learned from somebody who... At some point, it's got yeah. to go back to Joseph Pilates. Otherwise, it's not fucking Pilates. It's, it's right. okay. It's something else. But that's why, you know, in this culture, when people are like, you know, back then it was like Atkins, now it's keto. It's like, oh, I yeah. do keto. And then they're like eating ice cream. And you're like, that's not keto, bro. And it's like, oh, I'm right. doing my version. It's like, right. don't disrespect fucking keto. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like, because that that's not what this is about. And that's what most people do with programming. They right. hodgepodge and mix. Because, and I, and then, you what, I, yeah. and then they complain it doesn't work. Oh, I tried Atkins. It didn't work. Right. Like, you didn't actually try it, though. You didn't do it the way it was written. Correct. And what's <clears> interesting <throat> is, you know, I, I think we could, for our industry, I think we could trace it back to Alan Cosgrove, really right. popularizing right. that Bruce Lee quote about absorb what is useful, discard yeah. what is useless kind of stuff. Because what most people don't realize, even about Bruce Lee, is the fact that I'm all for that once there's a foundation laid. Meaning people don't realize he spent years doing traditional martial arts, understood footwork, understand distancing. You know, like it's like you can't just pick up a little boxing and a little fencing and a little stuff as someone who's never even come. You know, most kids, even athletes, don't know how to move laterally because they don't play tag anymore. Right. You know? So right. so they're weak, even if they're good at soccer. I had a, I had a young lady whose quad was like you know, her doctor was like, you'll love her. She's jacked. She's got abs. Her quads are like. <laughs> but laterally, she was very, very weak. Very weak. And even 
even with my UFC fighters, you know, they'll be like, I don't understand. Like I said, look, and this is how I explained it to him. It's like, let's put it this way. Yes, you're very fit for compared to the average person, but your your tires, your weakness, your tires are good for my car. They're right. shitty for a race car. Right. So they're not in relation to the right. caliber of output right, right that you're looking to to uh, yield out of your body. And so right. that being said, there's no lineage or rupa, there's no sense of foundation. So all these people are trying to hodgepodge and they've never learned anything. They've never had a good formal education. They don't understand like I tell professors, it's like, hey, if you miss, you know, X amount of classes, do you is there a chance of a kid passing your course? I'm like, no. Well, it's the same thing with a workout. It's the same thing with anything else. You have to be present. The most important thing of any relationship is presence. That's what I'm particular. I don't think I'm the strongest, the smartest, or any of that. I'm present. I'm so present that I'm ensconced in your whole freaking life. You know, from you know every, your routines to your people to, to your support system to your sponsors to this. You know, like I, I have a list of well-known Instagram people because all their sponsors are like this guy's injured. I need him out there producing again. I need him lifting, putting YouTube videos, competing in powerlifting competition. So my point being is most people don't want to ever show that they're injured. They don't want to show the process of coming back from being injured because they've already built too much of an image to start from ground zero again, like you and I have. And I think that's really important to right. illustrate to people that don't be afraid to start from the beginning. You know, I remember Gary Vaynerchuk, his, his, father's liquor store was tiny it was such a box that their parking lot was so small that they needed my uncle's parking lot for his martial arts school for the overflow during the holidays you know now his that that wine library takes up what used to be a, a grease monkey a burger king a taco bell like he took <laughs> over that do you know what i mean like yeah. it's amazing how he did it like because he lived right what's really interesting is he lived in milburn they're technically in milburn but it's right on the border of Short Hills, which is a very affluential area. And right. so all these people who knew about wine would be like, hey, do you have this? He's like, okay, what's the deal with that? So he'd order whatever is, you know, the 84 Chateau or whatever. He'd order it for the, the customer, but he'd also order it for the store thinking, I don't know shit, but this guy seems to know something or this is at least a demand. And then he started building a literal library of, of basically rare liquors due to the demands of his clients. And then of course he's, he educated himself from there. And it, it's fascinating to see that literally built. And I love that development. I know yeah. one of my buddies who's presenting, you know, we have a thing every year where it's just a gathering of my people from around the world. And it only started because somebody from Italy is like, I want to train and a bunch of other people are like I do too. So we just get together. It's not open to the public. It's just for people who, who train with me and who are somehow affiliated. And, Last year we had Mark Chang, Dr. Mark Chang present, and he was very, you know, and he presented his K3 material. I think he's one of the, I, I will say on record and say to everybody, he's one of the best presenters out there. He's a wonderful human being, first of all. And I'm very close with him. I'm honored to have been to his house, consider him a brother. But he, from a professional perspective, I think he's one of the best presenters out there. Educate, like in terms of relaying information, the quality of the information, and, and the sincerity. So yeah. I'm going to say that right now. So this year I have one of my old college buddies from Shrunko College, uh, John Turin, who was actually featured in Dragon Door because they were doing uh, FMS. Right. And they were doing some kettlebell stuff over it when he was a uh, strength and conditioning coach for the Indianapolis Colts. So okay. here's an interesting story that we, you know, that again summarizes who we are as people and what's most important is it's called personal training. Right. So you got to start with that. And in Springfield College, we're in Gula Hall, which is a freshman dorm. And it's a shitty dorm. I mean, the windows are this big. The rumors were that the architect's daughter committed suicide by jumping out a window. So the windows, it looked like a jail cell, basically. It was cement. So half of our freshman L wing in Gula Hall 2A, um, we liked each other so much. We had so much fun. We were like, hey, instead of splitting the whole gang up, Let's choose to stay in the freshman dorm, but stay in this. So we had dibs on this shitty dorm, but we loved the guys, right? So we were all, we all got, so half the dorm stayed and half, half of the L went left. And our floor was the only floor, and I don't know if it's still to this day, but we, we installed, we had them install a, a hook for a heavy bag. So I had a heavy bag that I kept in my room that I would hang in the common area and hit all the time, right? And so... When the freshmen came in the second year, 
John Turin or JT, as I know him, came in. He's on the football team. And we were sitting there in the common area, and we were talking, and you know how guys shoot the shit. We're, we're, we're saying jokes and very things that would be super offensive these days, non-PC, right? And just like, <laughs> right. And he comes over, and, he, and he's a pretty decently sized guy at the time, and he looks over and he goes, you fucking guys talking about Jews? And he was really offended. I was like, yeah, we're talking about Jews and, and, and wops and, and chinks and gooks and, you know, like every imaginable derogatory term we all. He goes, well, I'm Jewish. I go, well, I'm fucking Korean. What the fuck do you want from me, right? And then he started progressing with it, goes, well, you know, I go, I've probably been to more bar mitzvahs than you have. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I started reciting part of the Torah for him. And he's like, what the <laughs> fuck, right? And li- little then I started learning. He, he lived actually near my uncle in an area that I grew up by. So I became very close friends with him. So he would give me a ride back to my uncle's little time. I knew his father. I knew, you know, he introduced me to his judo instructor, Shimamoto. So we became good friends. And then eventually he got a job at the, as, as the strike coach over at the Bills. Wow. And what happened was that guy went over to the Colts and he brought JT with him for the Colts. And we stayed in touch and then lost track. And then one of my college roommates was like, you know, JT's on the sidelines for the Colts. I was like, really? So I called the Colts. I was like, what the fuck? And we caught up. We lost track and we caught up. And then they fired him. And then I lost track with him because his cell phone was, you know, via the Colts, I think, even the number I had. Right. And then I, the last couple of years, I got, got in touch with him again. We've been hanging out, going together. And he's presenting this year at my stuff to talk about longevity in terms of athletics. He's really adamant about, like, burning, basically using kids – so by the time he gets them at the professional level, that they're addicted to morphine, you know, they're, you know, these kids are wrecked. And he's very adamant about shit like that. He's going to like local school, like a town hall meetings to interrupt like the programs going like, How do you expect these kids to get anything fucking done when they have a batting coach, a strength and conditioning coach, the coach wants to work out this time because, you know, and he, he pulls the whole like, I'm nobody. And then he pulls his credentials of, hey, right. you know, I have a, Super Bowl, a few Super Bowl rings. You know, right. he still consults to all these major league teams and so forth. But my point being is what's most important are the relationships. And I think that people talk hashtag about what matters in life. But I'd like to see, like, the, I guarantee those same people are very introverted during prime time in Walmart. They want to get in, get out. They're not considerate of the elderly. They're not considerate of other people's perspectives. And I think that's what where we're having a lot of great deal of conflict, where people are so ego driven. And when I work with a lot of people with depression, with PTSD, with a lot of so forth, what I've illustrated to them with tough love is the fact that it's a very selfish conversation that they're having in their head, that they're not including their loved ones. They don't have to blast it. My thing is that you don't have to be, you know, I used to be like a very transparent person. Now I'm like, nobody gives a shit. And even those people who give a shit, it's none of their fucking business. So, right. you know, my right. thing is if subpoenaed in a court of law, I can always prove provide the evidence i could always show her who, who paid me money wire transfer why so i don't need to to hyperbolize you know when people say right. oh shit's crazy i'm like how crazy do you have a roof over your head are you in danger of not having food because if that's the case i'll help you it's like no it's none of that i go so basically you're hyperbolizing your situation it's not that right. crazy it's right. just you know it's uncertain and it was always uncertain so let's start with right. that right. so i think the most important thing here is people in our industry have no sense of self-identity and when i train people the most important thing i tell them is i can't give you self-confidence but i can give you the structural posture of self-worth in other words a strong deadlift you know a good glute activation a good leg you know dip and leg drive will give you the power of somebody who starts to stand up because i tell them you believe in something whether you believe in animal rights and you see a dog being you know malnourished whether it's because you love ice cream and you hear the ice cream truck. You know, the story I tell at my seminars is one, you know, like my daughter, when she was younger, you know, she's like, oh, dad, I'm so tired. I'm like, nice to meet you, tired. She goes, I'm not tired. My name's not tired. My name's Alexa, you know? <laughs> and it's like, but to show her that it's a temporal state and it right. doesn't define her. If you're hungry, you eat. If you, uh, you're tired, you take a nap. You, you do something about it. And then, and then it doesn't define you. So, but I said, you know what, that really sucks. She's like, why does that suck? I go, I was going to go get ice cream. She's like, ice cream. So all of a sudden, her spine kind of jacked up. I go, that's the whole point of strength training. You're going to feel very tired. In order to be strong, you're going to feel very weak. In order to build endurance, you're going to push yourself to the point where you feel like you have nothing. You know, and that's, you know, and that's what it comes to money making. That's what it comes, you're going to, it's, it's going to be risk reward. 
and you're going to have to push that. And that's that's what this is all about: is to push beyond the zone. Otherwise, everyone else who wishes they had money, wishes they had a nicer body, or wishes they were in a better position. See, I don't wish that I knew this person. I reach out to them, and even some people very resistant because they're like, "What's your angle? You know, who are you? You know, again, I'm not. I don't have a lot of followers." They, but then all of a sudden they talk to this person, they talk to that person. They're like, "Oh." So the right. next thing you know, two years later, they're calling me for advice. And that's like, and that, and I'm patient. That's why they don't have, it's just like, you know, engaging on a date. I don't expect the person to sleep with me on a first date. It takes time and everyone's different, right? right. But right. when you give that up, if guys understood that, they would get more, laid more readily. If they okay. gave up that desire, that yeah. leverage. That, that's, that's the attachment to that outcome that we're talking yeah. about. If you focused on just being a cool guy and having a fun time and so yeah. forth, you're going to be more attractive. And you're going to get that outcome without fixating on the outcome. Yeah. So that, that's just a lack of patience there. Well, look, man, we got to wrap up. So I like to wrap these up at two hours. I mean, we could keep going, bud, man. This is awesome. But Maybe I, I we'll leave it for another one next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. We'll definitely, we'll definitely talk again. And one of the, to, to reinforce one of your points, it doesn't matter how many Instagram followers you have. What you have is a great reputation. So when you talk to someone and they don't know you, you can just say, ask around, and they will, and it's going to come right back to you. It reminds me of, we'll, we'll, leave, we'll end with a 24 <laughs> analogy. In season seven of 24, Jack Bauer is in President Taylor's office, right? And she's never met him before. So she's going, he's telling her all these things, like, look, here's the situation, and you know, here's what we need to do about it. And she's like, well, why should I trust you? And he goes, with all due respect, Madam President, ask around. <laughs> you know? He's like, he's earned that. And if right. you ask around, people will be like, yeah, that guy's a bad motherfucker. Listen to what he has to say. Right. So he doesn't have to go out there and tell people, oh, I got this background and I did this. And, you know, season one, I did this. And then I saved these people. So, you know, he doesn't have to do all that. So listen, man, what's your Instagram handle? Because I want people to follow you. And I'm going to make these little clips and put them on Instagram. And I'm going to tag you in it so that people are aware of all your great information. Because I do want people to find out about you. Yeah, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, and I think the important note for from both of us that people can learn is we didn't always feel this way right we didn't always have this reputation i want that to be very clear yep. to people that we we were very insecure i can definitely speak for me very bitter um, a lot of times you know <laughs> very frustrated very depressed like what the fuck did i do did i shoot myself in the foot did you know ever, will i ever rise from these ashes so i want people to know i tell people if you're alive you have a chance to change it yeah. so so make yeah. that choice most people aren't willing to make that effort so yeah. You, you know, on out. that note, yeah, at innerwills.com. So I-N-N-E-R-W-I-L-L-S. Awesome. And it, it'll be in the show notes on YouTube. And then this is also going to be on my website and all that information will be there as well. But this was awesome, man. This is a great conversation. You know, I've done five conversations this week. That's it feels amazing. Like, feels like a three months. This week feels like three months because I've had five really good conversations the first conversation I had on Monday, that feels like a year ago. <laughs> you know, that's when you know you're getting so much done. I, I talked you to Penelope this week. I talked yeah. to Adam Blake, my friend Adam Blake this week. But I got to say, man, this is my favorite conversation of the week by far. This was oh, fun. This yeah, was man. really good, man. I'm really looking forward to getting this one out there. And I hope people listen and watch, watch and listen and learn because you're a wealth of knowledge. And I like the example you set because you have that. Take, it takes a lot of courage to be who you are and not be – this person that is just being pulled in all these directions like so many people where you're you're looking to other people to decide what your value is you're focused on relationship value and that's something that i think people need to understand more clearly and emphasize more clearly is that you can have currency as in financial currency but there's also people currency and it's not about what people can do for you it's not uh, what i don't mean is that you know all of these people that you can use that's not what i mean what I mean is that you know all these people that will be there for you. You're there for them. They're there for you. That's people currency. Yeah. And when things really count, that's going to be a lot more valuable than financial currency could ever be. So we should all cultivate people currency. And that starts with you being a good person and attracting good people, and it builds from there. And that's de what develops worth. And most of this compensation is due to lack of worth. Right. Exactly. Other things will take care of themselves. Well, this was awesome, man. And this was such a pleasure. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording because my fear with this is always that I hit the wrong button and we lose the whole episode. <laughs>